Hey everyone, in this video, I'm gonna take you from start to finish on the entire build process of this two by four foot end scale layout. It's an action packed layout that allows for operating four trains at the same time, two on the lower level, one on the middle level, and one on the upper level. A lot of switching operations are available as well. Storage on the interior. You can use DC or DCC. So really you can do a lot in a very small space with this layout, but it is a very long video. I've compiled the entire series into one video. I've stripped out the intros, stripped out the outros, some of the fluff in between as well to make it as short as possible, but it's still multiple hours long. So if you wanna watch the whole thing from start to finish, make a couple pots of coffee, maybe grab the Tostitos or whatever else you like a snack on, and, and sit back and watch a really long start to finish build of this layout. Anyway, before we get started, let me show you the track plan of this layout. Again, this is two loops of Kato Unitrack on the lower level. The outer loop has an 11 inch radius, the inner loop a nine and three quarter inch radius. The middle level here allows you to switch multiple industries. So you can have trains running on the lower loops while you do all the switching operations on the middle level. And that's really what I wanted out of this layout was to be able to watch trains run while I'm doing switching operations. At the same time, you have a small upper level that's removable, you can take it off swap in a forested hill, put this on a separate table, make it its own display because it's battery powered. So it's totally independent, but it fits right in place on this layout. So you have an urban scene that you can either use with the layout or somewhere else. So really, I think it's a fun layout, uh, a lot involved here. So anyway, let's get going on the full construction of this layout, starting off with the bench work. First off, here is a material list for what I use to build all of the layout benchwork. This isn't necessarily the best use of supplies and the cheapest way of doing things, uh, as I use individual two by four foot birch panels along with some four foot long pieces of poplar and one single six foot piece of pine. So cutting the birch panels down from a four by eight foot sheet of plywood and using longer pieces of lumber would actually probably be a little bit cheaper, but with the small sizes of the pieces, I was able to get all the materials in the back seat of our smaller vehicle, and it was easier to make sure that the plywood pieces I selected weren't warped and were all the same size. With most projects, I like to try out at least one new idea, and with this one, I wanted to try to build a base that was sturdy, but also very lightweight. And since it was only two by four feet in size, it wasn't really gonna be that heavy anyway, but being three levels, I wanted to save some weight here and there. And so for the base of this layout, I decided to try using quarter inch thick birch plywood, along with a layer of one inch thick insulation foam board in the middle. And with everything glued together, I figured it would be extremely rigid, but still very lightweight. I use birch plywood since that usually weighs less than regular plywood made out of pine. Plus it usually has a smoother surface since it's typically used in furniture. And the foam layer makes everything much more rigid and allows for a place to run wires. And I probably should have cut channels for the wires ahead of time, but it was easy to come back later on and drill some holes with some of my long drill bits. If I was doing this again, I probably would just end up using a 24 inch wide hollow core door and cut that to length and then maybe fill in that cut end with some pieces of plywood or dimensional pine or something like that. And that would make everything a lot easier to do. Anyway, since I needed to be able to attach wood size to the layout base in some way, and the quarter inch plywood and the foam layers really weren't gonna be able to hold screws very well, I decided to add blocks around the perimeter cut from half inch plywood that I had on hand. And I needed a wood layer that was one inch thick to equal the thickness of the foam board. But if you use dimensional lumber like a one by two, that's only gonna be three quarters of an inch thick. And I probably could have cut down some other wood to be a one inch thickness and use that, but I had the half inch thick plywood already. So I just went ahead and cut some strips of that and then chopped that down. Again, just buying a door would probably be an easier way to make this base or just doing regular framing with maybe half inch or three quarter inch thick plywood for the base and some one by twos or one by threes to add some dimensional stability. Anyway, I stacked up the plywood blocks in the corners and in the middle of each side, along with the very middle of the layout. And so I had to cut out sections of the foam board here and there where those blocks were to allow them to fit in there nicely. But then once I had that done, I glued everything down with some foam safe construction adhesive and the wood blocks with wood glue. Then I applied more glue and adhesive on top of the foam and wood blocks and attached the top layer. And now what I should have actually done was use a putty knife to spread out the foam board adhesive 
or simply just use wood glue everywhere since the thicker beads of the adhesive are kind of hard to squish flat without a lot of heavy weight on top. And so I walked back and forth over the top of the layout base to help squish everything together, but it was still hard to get everything firmly spread out. I tried clamping things to help hold everything together while it was drying, but I didn't have enough clamps for that to work, and plus I couldn't really squeeze the middle areas together very well. So instead I stacked up weights on the base, and eventually what I ended up doing was grabbing the punching and kicking bag my son and I use for Taekwondo practice, since that weighs about 250 pounds, and I just put that on top of the base to help squish everything flat while everything dried. I did also put a few screws into the wood blocks in the corners to help uh, make sure those were nice and tight as well. But once everything dried, I removed those wood screws since they weren't really needed. And you can see here that I still, in the end, ended up with a nice, flat, rigid, and lightweight panel. I sanded the sides with a sanding block, but I grabbed the orbital sander for doing the edges, as some of the plywood blocks in the corners and in the middle of the sides there had shifted a little bit when I was trying to pile up weights on top of everything, and so they kind of stuck out the edges a little bit, and so those had to be sanded flush. Next, I worked on attaching the sides to the layout base. I used half inch thick poplar boards that were six inches wide and 48 inches long for the layout sides, but one by six clear pine would work just as well. I clamped a one by three along one edge to act as a temporary spacer and then applied a layer of wood glue to the edge of one side of the layout base. And I apparently didn't really want you to see what I was doing exactly, so I kind of worked just off camera. And then using my brad nailer, I put a few brads into each of the wood blocks that were in the layout base to help hold everything secure while the glue dried. You could just use wood screws in those same locations, but using screws just really isn't quite as fun as using a nail gun. Anyway, with the back attached to the first level of the layout, I cut another poplar board to size for one of the layout sides, and then cut some pieces off a 2x2 two two pine board to help brace those corners. Uh, those would all be hidden anyway, so it didn't really matter what I used for that area, but I have a 2x2 two two pine board on hand, and so that is what I used. I glued a nail a 2x2 two two pine block to one of the corners, but I had to use a clamp to help squeeze the block back against the back board, and then I did the same to the other back corner of the layout. Then I clamped another 1x3 to the edge of a sideboard to act as a spacer again, and applied glue to the side, and then again using brad nails, I secured that side to the layout base, and then I flipped the layout over and attached the other side in the same way. At this point, I went ahead and grabbed the plates for attaching legs to the base of the layout along with some of the legs I had on hand. I had some shorter legs that are about four inches long, and then I have some longer ones that are like 28 to 30 inches long, and then a set that are about 20 inches long but have caster wheels attached to them, and those are the ones that I used here uh, and those came from an old 4x8 foot HO scale layout that I used to have in our upstairs game room that, I, that was actually built from the Woodland Scenics Grand Valley layout kit. Anyway, I screwed the mounting plates to the bottom of the layout and then temporarily added the legs. I eventually came back, removed the plates, and added pine blocks to each of the corners so the plates would have more structure to hang onto. And then once the plates were attached, I threaded on the legs, and then I had a layout that could easily roll around the garage floor as I worked on it. Before working on the next level of the layout, I needed to get the track temporarily put in place on the lowest level. That way I could make sure that none of the wood supports for the second level would cause clearance issues with trains on the first level. And the outer loop of the lower level uses 11 inch radius curves, and the inner loop uses 9 and 3 quarter inch radius curves. I added a set of terminal rail joiners to the outer loop so I could power that, and then run a longer locomotive to make sure there weren't any clearance issues as I worked on placing in the support structure. And here is a list of Kato track that I used for each of these loops, and, but I'll actually be doing the full track installation wiring in the next video, and so I'll have more details at that time. Anyway, I used half inch by three inch poplar board to act as both a support for the front edge of the second level, as well as the back of what would eventually become a retaining wall along that part of the layout. I used my speed square to figure out what angles I should cut the various pieces so I could join them together with relatively tight seams. I worked my way around the front of the layout, cutting pieces to size as I built the retaining wall and supports. Now, sadly, the camera just kept remaining off focus for most of this, but you can kind of see here what the final arrangement of pieces looked like in the end. And I simply glued all these pieces together and to the layout itself and didn't use any screws or nails at this point in time to help secure everything. 
And here are what the approximate lengths and angles of each of these segments are. And so if you are building it yourself, you can kind of copy that if you want, but you don't really need to follow this exactly, just basically do something relatively similar. I also added some additional wood support to the interior, making kind of an enclosed box in the middle of the layout. And I'll probably eventually add some additional supports on either side of that box area to really make sure that second level is supported well. And once the glue on those supports had dried, I placed the three quarter inch plywood base for the middle level on top of all those supports and used a pencil to trace along the edge of the support so I would know where to make my cuts. Then I flipped the board over and used another wood board to kind of act as a straight edge and filled in all the gaps in the marks that I had made. I used my circular saw to make all the cuts, but I did have to finish off a few of the corners with a handsaw. And then a good sanding was needed along those edges. And then after blowing the sawdust off with my leaf blower, I test fit the middle level base on the lower level. And luckily things lined up pretty good. So I didn't really have to adjust anything. And then with the plywood base cut to size, I took another four foot long piece of that six inch poplar that I had on hand and ran a bead of glue along one edge and then secured that to the back of the plywood base there with several brad nails. I did end up needing to trim one side slightly, so I just did that with my circular saw and then sanded the cut smooth. I salvaged a brass hinge from an old bookcase that had a drop down desk and decided to use that hinge on this project. I roughly measured things to get the hinge approximately centered and then used some tape to hold it in place. I put in several screws and then tested the hinge and played around with trying to figure out a solution for the magnetic latch. And what ended up working out was to take two of the cabinet lashes that I had that had steel plates and magnets and put those together and screw those to the bottom part of the layout. And then I used two neodymium magnets on the lid portion. Those two neodymium magnets with the magnets on the bottom make for a very strong attachment. You actually have to pull pretty hard on the lid to get it to open. And with that latch figured out, I went back and added in all the remaining screws to the back hinge. Now I did also salvage a pair of support arms from that same desk that I took the hinge from and I attached those to the base and the lid and you can see here how and where I did those. Fortunately there is still enough clearance under the support arms when they are in a down position so the trains can pass underneath them without any interference. Uh, and they seem to work really well and I do have tension knobs so you can turn those tighter or looser to control how easy or hard it is to open and close the lid. Now these won't work from keeping the lid from closing shut on you. You actually need a pneumatic arm for that. And I use a pneumatic arm on my small one by five foot end scale switching layout. But they do keep the lid from opening more than 90 degrees, which is the main problem here because the top side of the lid is gonna have that third level plus a lot of structures and scenery and everything else. And so it's gonna be really heavy on that side. And so if you open it up, it's gonna have a tendency to open up all the way and flop over. And so these support arms keep it from opening past 90 degrees and falling over. And what I might do as well is come back and add a couple of wood blocks on the back of the lower level there to really help prevent that lid from opening any more than 90 degrees. And with the hinge and support arms attached, I worked on attaching the sides to the middle level. I measured and cut those to length. And then I cut one of the corners off each side, leaving about 1.5 inches below the diagonal cut. And really, I just wanted to have something to really take away that sharp corner that would be there if I had left everything as it was, since that would likely end up being something I would cut my arm on or whatever else. And I could have just rounded it off nicely and done that, but I kind of liked the look of having that 45 degree angle cut. And to attach the side pieces, I applied glue to the, along the edge of one side, and then again, used my brad nailer to secure everything while the glue dried. A couple of nails did end up poking out the back sides of the back board, but it was easy to come through and just break those off with a pair of pliers. Then I'll just come back with some wood putty and fill in those holes later on. So I got the other side attached and then I worked on cutting out the board for the very top level. I placed a track loop on another piece of that quarter inch birch plywood and then just used a ruler to kind of mark out the areas I wanted to cut. I cut that out with my circular saw, sanded the edges, and then test fit it on the layout. It turned out that one of the corners was going to overhang the lowest level and so I had to kind of cut off an inch on one side. But instead of using my saw again, I just scored it repeatedly with a knife until I was able to snap it off and have a nice clean break there. Uh, and then in order to make sure the supports for the top level wouldn't interfere with the track on the middle level, I, I again had to go ahead and assemble all the track on that middle level. I followed the track plan I had pulled up on my iPad and worked on assembling all the track pieces. That was a bit tricky in a few spots since not all the Kato track pieces are labeled in the same way and I had already tossed all the packages that said what pieces were what. 
And so in a few areas, I actually had to take out a ruler and measure how long they were in millimeters to know uh, which track piece to put where. But I got everything assembled okay without too much trouble and everything seemed to fit pretty nicely. So for the upper level supports, I used a piece of one by three clear pine and I cut pieces to go against the back and sides of the layout and then along the front edges. And then like with the lower supports, I worked my way around figuring out what angle to cut each piece in order to get it to match up with the upper level and to fit pretty tightly with each other. Uh, I marked out where I needed to put the supports with a pencil and then put down the glue and reattached all the pieces in those areas. And then I kind of came back and filled in some additional interior supports as well to make sure that upper level had plenty of support. And again, if you are building this layout yourself, you don't need to follow these measurements exa exactly, but uh, here are the measurements in the various points on the whole upper level there if you want to try to cut everything to about the same size. Finally, I used a 1x2 clear pine board to create a fourth level that would hide part of that third level track loop and allow me to raise out some of the structures in that area for a more visually interesting look to that part of the layout. I'll also eventually extend the side walls in this area to add a little bit more protection to those top level buildings, but for now I'll leave that alone. Anyway, you, you can see that this layout should have a lot of visual interest with all the various levels. I may have some structures also that span multiple levels, kind of going from the second to the third level and so forth, to really kind of tie everything together and look a lot more interesting. Okay, so I started by assembling all the Kato unit track on each level of the layout. And then using a carpenter's pencil, I traced out the track locations on the plywood bases. And once I marked the track locations, I marked out all of the locations where I needed to drill holes for the power leads. I had initially forgotten to mark out the holes for the turnout wires, so I later went back and drilled those holes as well. After removing all the track from the layout and summoning my drill into existence, I used a half inch bit to drill holes for the power leads on the bottom level. I didn't drill all the way through the base, uh, just through the top layer of plywood into the middle layer of foam. Then I took a 12 inch long 3 8 inch drill bit and drilled a hole through the back of the layout such that it would line up with the holes where the power leads were on that side of the layout. But somehow I completely boshed up my measuring, so I had to drill a second hole about an inch over from the first one. And I'll eventually use both holes in the back for plugs for power cables, so I don't think I'll need to fill in the extra hole, but it's just one more example of why it's helpful to use the measure twice and cut once rule of thumb. I then used a three quarter inch step drill bit that is used for drilling holes in metal plates, but which makes for very clean holes in wood. With that drill bit, I drilled a hole in the interior box of the lower level in line with the hole that I drilled from the back. This way I could send the power leads from the track up through that hole into the interior box section of the layout. A quick vacuum removed the sawdust and some of the foam bits from inside the hole so it would be ready for wires. Before attaching and wiring the track on the lower level, I painted the interior a flat black. This way when you look into the tunnel portals, the interior will look dark and you will not see the bare wood. I painted over the pencil marks for the track locations but left a stripe in the middle of each track loop so I would know where the track was to be centered. I used brown paint on the front of the layout so any missing bits of scenery wouldn't show the exposed wood. To attach the track on the bottom level, I poured some white glue from a jug and painted that along the track lines. Since the paint wasn't completely dry, the glue mixed with the paint, but that wasn't a problem. Painting on the glue smeared most of the track location markings, but that wasn't too important on the bottom loops since they are just simple ovals. Next, I fed the power feeders through the holes in the layout base, through the channels in the foam, and then pulled them out into the interior bay of the layout. Sometimes the wires needed some help, so in one case I used my long drill bit to help push the wires through into the interior of the layout. With the wires in place, I attached the feeders to the unit track and set those track sections in place. Once I had the straight sections with the feeders in place on the front and back of the layout, I worked on attaching the curved ends of each loop to the straight sections, making sure all the joints were lined up properly. The nice thing about using white glue to attach the track was that I was able to easily make adjustments. That allowed me to make sure the spacing between each track loop was even all the way around the layout. You can't adjust the track easily when using hot glue or even latex caulk, so white glue works great in situations where you know you're going to need to make some adjustments. 
With the track in place, I took an alcohol wipe and cleaned off the rail surfaces since I figured there was probably a little glue here and there on the rails during installation. Then I tested the inner and outer loops by pushing some freight cars at high speed around both loops. Pushing cars is usually a good way to find any spots where track imperfections are causing problems. I did this before the glue dried so I could still easily adjust the track if needed. And to ensure the track didn't shift while the glue dried, I used various weights on the track, including the tried and true method of canned soups and vegetables. Once everything dried on the first level, it was time to start the track installation on the second level. I again used a half inch drill bit to drill holes for all the feeder wires on this level. And after drilling out those holes, I switched to that three quarter inch step drill bit and cleaned up the holes from both sides so I wouldn't have any rough edges. A sanding block helped to finish the job of smoothing all the holes out. While it probably wouldn't be an issue, I didn't want any rough edges that might wear through the insulation on the wires, eventually causing a short. Since this level can swing up and down, the wires might move a little bit more than on the bottom level. After a quick vacuum, I decided to paint the top of the box on the lower level so when I closed the lid it would leave a mark on the underside, showing me where I shouldn't run wires. And well, that just didn't work at all. So while I had the black paint out, I decided to paint the tunnel portion of the middle level and then the remaining base area brown, leaving the middle of the track areas unpainted so I would know where to place the track. I then opened up the middle level, masked off the edges on the sides, which I wanted to be stained and not painted, and then painted the bottom side black. While painting or staining everything isn't strictly needed, I like doing that to help seal the wood so it won't swell or contract too much with moisture changes. I also painted the interior box section of the lowest level black as well as the back corners to finish up the job. Finally, it was time to attach the track to the middle level. I started in the back right corner and ran the wire for that turnout through the hole and then one of the power feeder wires through its hole. I proceeded around the layout attaching terminal rail joiners and pulling those wires through the hole, but I quickly realized that the hole for the first turnout was not quite in the right spot. I shaved off some wood around the hole to allow a place for the wire to pass and then proceeded around the layout with attaching more wires. The key here is to make sure you remain consistent with the wiring, so I made sure the blue wire was used on the inside rail and the white wire on the outside rail all the way around the loop. I was still having issues with the turnout wire on that first turnout, so I cut off some of the metal backing on the bottom of the turnout and then covered the edge with some electrical tape. And then I nipped off a bit of plastic on the bottom as well so the wires could run to the hole without being crimped by anything. And that was the first track piece I attached using some hot glue to hold everything firmly in place. I then worked my way around that part of the layout gluing down sections of track. Before gluing anything else, I attached the remaining track pieces so I wouldn't get myself in trouble and end up with track sections that didn't align. I got the remaining track pieces attached and then started working on gluing those pieces down. I quickly noticed though that one of the first pieces I glued wasn't sitting flush against the plywood so I had to use one of my utility knives with a long break off blade to cut out all the hot glue in that area. Once I was able to remove the glue and get that track section to sit flush with the plywood, I made sure all the other pieces in that area were sitting flush and joining up evenly. Then I continued with applying hot glue to attach these remaining sections. Just using white glue on this level would have actually been a lot easier since I could have made adjustments easily like I did on the lower level, but in the end I managed to get all the track installed securely and flush with the plywood. With the track attached, it was time to organize the rat's nest of wires on the bottom of the middle level. I wasn't trying to complete the wiring here, but just to get the wires secured and out of the way. I used a staple gun and staples that are designed for securing wires to do that. I bundled wires together and secured them in place every few inches with the staples. The key here was to make sure I ran the wires in places where they wouldn't be crushed against the wood supports that are on the bottom level. Most of the wires were actually within the interior box section and the others I ran such that I would only need to cut out one part of the wood on the bottom level to allow them to pass into that middle box section. I wanted all the power leads to connect to a single power cable so I cut the feeder wires in one section to the same length stripped off the insulation, and then twisted those wires together ensuring all the blue and white wires were kept separate. I did the same for the second group of feeder wires and then ran a short section of wire between those two groups. I was just twisting wires together at this point for a temporary connection to make sure everything worked and I hadn't installed one of the feeders backwards. 
I then connected a single power feeder with a plug attached and connected that to one of my Roku hand throttles and happily found out that the wiring was done correctly. With power going to all the feeder wires, I ran a locomotive around the layout, testing out the different turnouts. The six axle locomotive I was initially using for the testing didn't like the 8.5 inch radius curves too much, and so I switched to a four axle diesel to continue testing the track work. Everything was running smoothly, so I attached some freight cars and ran those around the layout for a while as well, looking for any spots where the cars might be bouncing or not tracking too smoothly. Everything looked okay, so I proceeded to working on the top level loop of track. I only wanted to use one feeder wire on this loop, so I decided to solder all the track connections together, except for the one with the feeder wire. I needed to keep one section of track unsoldered to allow me to install it back on the layout. I worked my way around the track loop, soldering the outside of the rails in each section, making sure I had a good solder joint across both sections of track without getting any on top of the rail. Once the soldering was done, I tested the track loop with the Kato tram unit to make sure things ran well in both directions with no issues at any of the rail joints. And with the tests going well, it was time to install the track on the top base section of the layout. I marked where the power leads were going to go and then drilled a hole through the plywood base. I ran the power lead through the hole and connected the track sections back together. I used white glue again on this level to install the track, painting it where the track was to be attached, and then I used several clamps to ensure the track didn't move while the glue dried. I had never finished that front fascia piece for the layout, so I took a piece of 6 inch by 48 inch long, half inch thick poplar board and marked out where I wanted to cut it out. If I left everything uncut, it would block the tracks on the lower level from view, so I had to cut about 3 inches off the board, uh, with, except for those few inches on either end where they were going to be covering up the enclosed portions of that lower level. I did all the cuts with my circular saw, simply dropping the blade down through the board on the marked line and then cutting steadily down the line. I find I get a much straighter cut like this than using a jigsaw. I could have used a guide to make sure I had a straight cut, but I don't usually have too much trouble keeping the saw going straight down a line. And since the cut portion of the fascia wasn't going to be adjoining any other piece of wood, uh, any slight variations didn't really matter. I did have to clean up the corners though, and I just used a coping saw for that since that was the first saw that I had handy at the time. The fascia piece fit snugly, and so I didn't screw it in place, and I actually still haven't done that since I will need to remove it frequently to work on the wiring anyway. Eventually I'll secure it with a few wood screws, but I likely won't worry about that yet since it stays in place by itself pretty well at this point. In order to dress up the plywood edges of the middle level, I cut a couple pieces of 1x2 pine. While that resulted in those pieces sticking out a little past the lower level fascia board, I planned to sand them flush later on. I glued on both of those sections and then secured them with a few brad nails both from the front and from the side. Sadly, one of my brad nails from the side ended up protruding from the front of it, so I took a screwdriver and a hammer and made it go back to its home inside the wood. I felt like installing the mounting plate with the DCC throttle plugs to the fascia next, and so I drilled a hole in each of the four corners of the rectangle I needed to cut out for that board to fit. Then, because I'm pretty much a lazy woodworker, I cut the rectangle out with my jigsaw while holding the board in place with one foot on one end and my free hand on the other. Luckily, it came out fine, and I didn't ruin the fascia board, and I test fit the fascia board with a DCC plug board on the layout, and then searched for a few wood screws to attach it. But before attaching the DCC panel faceplate, I got the power supply and track wires ready to attach first. For the track power, NCE gives you a plug with some screw terminals to attach your wires to the back of the panel. I attached a section of wire to those screw terminals and then fed the wire through the channel in the foam into the interior bay of the layout. Then I fed the NCE power cable through the hole in the back of the layout into the interior box and then from there through the hole that goes to the control panel. I plugged everything into the panel and then discovered that I didn't have quite enough clearance for everything to fit, so I grabbed a pair of wire cutters since that was the first tool my eyes landed on and used that to chip away more of the foam from behind the control panel. I did that until everything fit easily with some room to spare for the wires. Then I finally screwed the panel to the fascia and moved on to working on the interior wiring. So while there were only four power leads for the lower level tracks, I didn't know which ones to connect together in order to keep the power supplies to each loop of track independent. So I put one of my steeple cab locomotives on each track and hooked up a wire to a Roku hand unit and then connected power leads to that wire to see which track they powered. 
Once I identified which of the front wires power the outer loop, I had to figure out which of the back wires connected to the same outer loop. Which locomotive started moving determined which wire went to which loop of track. Then it was just a matter of connecting the two wires for the outer track together and the two wires for the inner track loop together. And then I took two more sets of power leads that still had their plugs attached on one end, stripped the insulation off the other end of the wires, and then slid on a piece of heat shrink tubing onto each wire. I was then ready to twist the wires together, making sure I had a good physical connection between all the wires, and then solder the connections together. After soldering each connection, I took a pair of nippers and trimmed off any stray wires or sharp areas on the soldered connection so nothing would poke through the heat shrink tubing. With that done, I slid the tubing over the connection and shrunk down the first tube with the heat from the soldering iron, and that works fine, but it's a little slower than using a heat gun or a lighter, so for the second connection, I did grab a lighter to shrink the tube faster. With the connections done on the outer loop wires, I did the same for the inner loop wires. I then secured the wires to the layout base with a few staples. And this left me with two plugs, one for each loop that I could attach to my Roku hand throttles for testing and initial runs. With the lower level wiring complete for now, I worked on soldering the previous temporary connections on the middle level, insulating each of the joints with heat shrink tubing as I went. I attached a longer power lead to the middle level since that level was to be temporarily connected to the DCC panel on the fascia. I just wrapped up all the turnout control wires in a bundle and tucked them under another wire to keep them out of the way for now since I didn't plan on wiring those up until later. I wanted to get the layout exterior stained at this point so I used some wood putty to fill in all the nail holes, joints, and other imperfections. Sometimes people will comment that they are impressed with my woodworking skills, but the reality is that I'm a rather subpar woodworker, but I'm pretty good at fixing mistakes. And it's really amazing what wood filler and an orbital sander can do in terms of improving the appearance of your wood projects. Some of my wood joints needed a lot of sanding to be flush and look good, but I eventually smoothed everything out. I also sanded off the corners on all of the top and bottom edges of the sideboards so they would feel and look a little bit nicer. And I also had to sand a lot off those one by two pieces on the front so they would be flush and even with the adjacent wood pieces. Once I finished the sanding, I took the leaf blower and blew all the dust off the layout and out the garage door in order to get it ready for staining. I used cherry colored wood stain on this layout project again since I like that color a lot and I applied the stain with a cheap brush, fully coating one side at a time before wiping off the excess stain with some paper towels. I proceeded to stain the sides, inside edges, inside of the top section, and basically all the remaining exposed wood areas, including both the front and back of the fascia board. I still have to go back and stain the bottom of the layout at some point in the future. Again, the normally non-visible portions don't have to be stained or painted, but doing so helps prevent expansion and contraction of the wood with moisture changes. Also, I just think projects look a lot more professional when even the hidden areas look nice. Anyway, with the staining done, this chapter of the layout build has come to a close. I was able to get trains running on all of the track loops at the same time for testing, which marked a big step in the building of this layout project. In this video, I'm going to show you how I built this concrete retaining wall. Okay, so if you saw my video a few weeks ago on my new laser cutter, you saw how I cut out panels and tunnel portals from birch plywood with that laser cutter. I'll have a link down in the description to that video as well as to the laser cutter itself. Anyway, I cut out panels from plywood to serve as retaining walls and also to serve to hide the front edge of the middle level. Now to finish off the retaining walls, I played around with some different ideas and what I ended up doing was to add a strip of styrene to the plywood panels along the top and then vertically to add some detail and make it look more like a solid concrete retaining wall. The technique I used was to scrape on some drywall spackle to hide any of the stronger wood grain and then paint everything with a mixture of paint and white PVA glue. So here you can see the plaster material I used. This ended up really not working out that great and wasn't really needed in the end because the glue and paint mixture was so thick. But for the initial pieces, I scraped on the patching plaster and then mixed up the glue and paint mix. I just picked a gray color paint that I already had on hand and that was probably a little too dark overall uh, and not really quite beige enough, but I'll try to get that color a little bit better later on with weathering powders. After painting on the first coat, I grabbed some packages of strip styrene and used a thicker one for the top of the wall and then the thinner ones for the vertical pieces. I just cut these to size and pushed them into the paint and glue mix. 
Now you might be saying, Steve, PVA glue isn't going to bond styrene to wood very well. And while that is true, um, because I am adding multiple coats of the glue and paint on top of the styrene, that should actually bond everything just fine. There'll effectively be a you know, relatively thick coat of the PVA glue coating everything, and that should create a solid shell, preventing anything from peeling away. After getting all the pieces cut and pressed into place, I put a coat of that glue and paint mix on top of everything and then set that completed piece aside. I repeated the process for three more wall sections and then moved on to the tunnel portals. I wanted those sections to look thicker and so I took some scrap pieces of insulation foam board and cut those to match the tunnel portals. I would have used my hot wire cutter to do that but my hands were pretty much a mess. I didn't want to go and wash them first or get any of the paint or plaster and, and glue mix on anything else. I cut out the foam for the first tunnel portal such that it was only slightly larger than the opening to the portal so it would still actually fit inside the existing opening on the layout. Then I glued that to the back of the tunnel portal with some wood glue and then filled in the joint with some additional patching plaster. Finally I painted everything with the paint and glue mix. Then I added the styrene strips to the top and sides and put another coat of the glue mix on top of that. I finished the last two remaining wall segments and then worked on the second tunnel portal using the same process as the first one. And with those done, I put everything aside to dry for a few hours. Once everything was dry, I took a 400 grit sanding stick and sanded all the various pieces smooth, trying to get any little bumps or ridges that were in place pretty much uh, flattened out. The sanding took a lot of the paint off in places, but since I was planning on doing multiple coats anyway, I really wasn't worried about that. I wanted to get the wall pieces glued in place first though before adding any additional coats of paint, so I grabbed some wood glue and started attaching pieces to the layout. First though I raised up the middle level on blocks so I wouldn't accidentally glue it shut. I used plenty of glue on the back, bottom, and sides of each piece and then pushed them into place and then I just used my handy 1-2-3 blocks to help keep everything from shifting. For the left tunnel portal, I had to add a strip of wood to one side to move the tunnel portal out just far enough to, to prevent it from hitting the middle level base when it was closing. And it was just easier to do that than it was to saw off a little bit more from that edge of the middle level. Then I glued down the left tunnel portal and sized up the wall section between the tunnel portal and the front center section. I shaved the right edge at a 45 degree angle with a knife so it would sit flush against the adjoining piece and make for a nice tight seam. Then I glued that piece in place as well. Next I got the remaining short wall section on the left hand side glued in place and then moved on to finishing up the right side. I got the tunnel portal section glued in place and then the adjoining two wall sections. I shaved one edge on both of them so they would fit snugly and also added some strip wood behind the short wall section on the right so it wouldn't interfere with the middle level base again. Once the glue was dry, I came back with a patching plaster and a putty knife and filled in all the seams the best I could so there weren't any gaps that were visible. And just like with woodworking, some filler and sandpaper goes a long way in getting everything to look a lot better. I mixed up another batch of the glue and gray paint and added another coat on top of all the wall panel sections. I eventually added more paint since the mix was really a little bit too transparent. And after the first additional coat dried, I came back and added a second coat to all the wall panel sections and even a third coat in some areas. Once the paint mix was sufficiently dry, I wanted to work on the weathering. So I took some German Grey Vallejo paint and added that to a mix of water and alcohol. And I used the alcohol in there as well just so everything would dry faster, but it ended up really drying too fast. I brushed the black wash over all the wall sections, trying to get even coverage, but the wash was drying too fast, and so I wasn't able to get it quite as even as I would have liked. Next I grabbed a gray and tan pan pastel and a brown AMI weathering powder and then I got a large brush and worked all of those onto the walls. I used the gray first to help blend in the black wash I had used earlier and that helped to lighten everything up a little bit and then I came back with a tan color to add some dirt color to the walls. Finally I used some of the dirt ballast I normally use as my base ground cover and brushed that onto the walls as well. Finally, I took some black powder and applied that above the tunnel portals where exhaust from the diesel engines would likely blacken things up. I covered the lower tracks with some masking tape and then I took a can of dull coat and I sprayed all the wall sections down to secure the weathering powder in place. But the dull coat always ends up making the weathering powder kind of disappear and so once that was dry, I came back and applied another round of weathering powder to all the walls. Then I sprayed on the, another layer of dull coat and then came back and did another round of weathering powder. 
finally, I pulled out the tape, vacuumed off all the excess powder, and then cleaned up the rails with some alcohol wipes, and the lower level retaining walls were done, at least for now. Here you can see what the walls look like from the inside. I'll probably come back and paint the inside of the walls either black or gray, but I'll worry about that later. In this video, we're going to take a look at how I set up the middle level of this 2 by 4 foot end scale layout to have both handheld DC and DCC control uh, using a selector switch to choose which one you want to use. Okay, so there's different steps I got to do here before I install anything on a layout. First, I have to hook up a plug to this DC handheld controller. So I have this four pin plug and uh, receptacle here that I will, this will go on the layout. This will get attached to this cord. So you can plug it into here and uh, have your connection. So I'll have to work on that. So connecting the wires to here, connecting wires from here that I can run through the bottom of the layout. And then I'm going to have this adapter on the back of the layout that I can plug in a power supply, which will obviously eventually connect to this inside the layout. So I want to get a lot of this stuff wired up, heat shrink tubing put on everything, get everything ready to go, and then I can run the wires, you know, drill the holes in the layout, put the plugs in, run the wires through, and make the connections. So the only thing to be careful with here is that you have to, with this plug, you have to make sure you have things consistent. So I'm using wires that are basically the same color as what is in this cable. And so I have to make sure that when I plug stuff together, I have say like a black wire here and a black wire here, red here and red here. So everything is the same on both sides. And this way I don't mix anything up in the final wiring. Now I'm gonna make sure I have all little stray wires clipped off best I can. <clears throat> and so there is some parts where the wire, where the insulation got cut off. And uh, I have the liquid electrical tape somewhere. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of that liquid tape on there. It's kind of actually coat everything pretty good because we're also gonna cover it with this metal sleeve. So any little wire sticking out could contact the metal sleeve and then short out one of the other wires. So, so I'm going to take some electrical tape here and just fatten up this wire. So when I cinch down on the screw terminals, it'll have something to kind of bite into. So if I can get this to slide in, perhaps I can get this screw in. Now I can't find the screwdriver. This ring goes down here. All right, so now this, this will be mounted to the layout. So then I'll just be able to plug this in when I want to use the throttle, um, or you can unplug it and then, you know, not use it, put it away, whatever you want to do. And we should be good to go. Anyway, let's do some drilling. Okay, so let's just review how I have everything wired up here for switching between DC and DCC control of the middle level, which is the primary switching uh, area on the layout. So this toggle switch is a double pull, double throw toggle switch. So the leads here in the middle are what go to the track. And then if I connect the DCC system to this side, and the output from the DC controller to this side, then depending on which way I have the switch thrown, 
it will basically connect these wires to the middle or these wires to the middle and then alternate what power goes to the track while cutting off the other ones. So it works pretty nice, uh, pretty straightforward. And then I have, this is the power going into the power cab uh, from the wall, which will go through a plug on the back of the layout. And then these wires here provide the power uh, to the handheld controller, again, coming from an, uh, a wall mounted ad adapter that goes to a plug on the back of the layout. And so this is basically AC power in, AC power in here. And then we have the DCC control going out and the DC control going out and these wires here. And then you just flip the switch on this side and that determines which way the control goes. So if I put the switch towards this jack, then DCC is controlling that loop of the layout. If I flip the switch this way, then the DC throttle is controlling that part of the layout. Now, now you might be wondering why the wires for DCC are on this side when, when I throw the switch this way, it connects to the DC one. And that's just because you have to basically just think of this as a lever going back and forth. So when you have it thrown this way, it's basically connecting this terminal, these two terminals together and these two terminals together. And then when I throw it this way, it's connecting these two terminals together and these two terminals back here together. Pins that are connected are going to be on the opposite of the side that the actual lever is thrown. So not a big deal. You can always just flip this around or just move this, the wires to the other side if you have it backwards, but that's how it's set up. So pretty straightforward once everything is done. And so now that I have everything else done, I can make those connections, but I'll just make sure I have a lot of uh, slack in the wire here so I can remove this front panel and you'll not have any issues doing that. And while it might make more sense just to have a plug here to connect these together, that would make more sense essentially in the long run. The reality is I'm gonna have a bunch of other controls on here for the turnouts and everything else. I don't really wanna have plugs for all of them just because I don't wanna do all that extra wiring. So I'm not gonna bother with that at this point. Maybe I'll do that later on. It, you know, not a hard addition to do down the road, but for now I just wanna get everything soldered and insulated so I don't end up shorting out something and causing more damage than I've already done to this project. And so I am soldering on these extra wires because I will be hooking them up to this other gauge master controller. And these DC controllers will be for these lower tracks down here. And it'll be all on the same power supply. The adapter I have is for two and a half amps, which is more than enough to run three trains. And so I am going to go ahead and uh, allow for that. And so I'll get this attached and the turnout controls attached in another video but I'm gonna go ahead and get these wires ready to attach to here uh, so I won't have to do any additional soldering on these uh, power supplies. So those are done. The only other connection to do is for the DCC power. So I can go ahead and get all these pulled in here and hopefully not have any wires get mushed see if I can feed these two guys back in as well. The handheld DC throttle just wasn't working at all. Couldn't figure out why, you know, something on this board that was inside of there got blown. Uh, anyway, so I took this out and I have this other gauge master two throttle unit, which is actually has identical boards in it. Everything lines up exactly. And so I just popped that one in here. I rigged up a, you know, some washers and a screw there to a, to uh, use as a heat sink. So it'll just help a little bit. The other one didn't have any, didn't have any heat sink at all. I just cooked the board. So that could have been part of the problem. But um, so this one, you know, maybe that'll help out just a little bit. But yeah, so this works fine now. I had ordered another one, but you know, maybe I'll cancel that, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I guess I'll probably keep it because I do need to rebuild the this uh, board here and put the unit back in there so I can use those two DC controllers for the bottom tracks when I'm not using the DCC system. So anyway, this will at least provide a working throttle for now when I'm working on operating the middle level here during a uh, construction anyway. So 
So, so anyway, that's how I got the DC and DCC controls set up for this middle level. So let's take a look at how I did this portion of the scenery. Okay, so I started out by painting the rail of the Kata unit track to help hide the size and make it look more realistic. Since code 80 rail in end scale is really oversized, I often paint the rail darker than what is realistic since a darker rail tends to disappear more. I tried some different products this go around and used Liquitex soft body acrylic in burnt umber color, as well as a burnt umber and a carbon black acrylic ink. I kind of just mixed those all together using the inks to help thin out the soft body acrylic. The net result was something that was thin enough to easily run into all the nooks and crannies around the tie spikes and such when it was painted on the rail. I'm not actually recommending that you use these products as any kind of rail brown colored paint will work, but these products seem to work fine for me and I just wanted to try them out after seeing them in the store. I brushed the paint and ink mix on the rails and that is actually a lot faster and easier than using those paint markers for painting the rail. The paint markers work great for the first couple of feet, but then the tips get worn out and they quickly become hard to use. A paint marker that had an actual bristle brush on the end of a tip would really be a great invention, I think. Anyway, once I got the rail painted, I moved on to ballasting. What I like to do, and what I think is a critical step to help avoid longer term failure of your ballast, is to paint on a layer of glue before you actually apply any of the ballast. I just use good old Elmer's white glue here, painting on a thick layer where I plan to put ground cover and ballast. Next, I took some Scenic Express earth ballast and applied that in the areas away from the track as a ground cover base, and then I used a spoon to spread out my ballast mix over the track. I can't tell you what type of ballast this actually is, since it's actually a mix of probably five different ballasts. Every time my container of ballast starts to get low, I buy another bag or two of some type of gray blend ballast and dump it into the container and mix it all up. Anyway, after pouring on the ballast, I use a soft brush to spread it out the best I can to help get everything nice and smooth and get everything looking pretty good. Once I'm happy with how the ballast looks, I spray one section at a time with alcohol to serve as a wetting agent and then use a dropper to dribble on diluted matte medium. I'm not sure what the ratio was exactly in this mix, but usually it's around 25% matte medium to the rest water. You could just use a basic white PVA glue instead of the matte medium since that is cheaper, but that can sometimes leave a slightly glossy appearance when it dries. Usually that's not really much of an issue, but the matte medium always dries flat. Anyway, whatever you use will darken the ballast, however, so keep that in mind when applying your ballast mix since the final color will be darker than what it looks like out of the bag. Make sure you apply enough of the glue mix so all the ballast looks fully saturated. Here is where the base layer of glue helps out too, as that will help glue down the bottom of the ballast in case the glue mix doesn't fully seep down all the way through the entire ballast layer. Also, don't expect to be able to finish ballasting the track in one single pass. I almost always need to apply ballast two or three times to get everything looking good enough for my taste, so don't worry too much if some ballast gets washed away by the glue or doesn't look quite right after applying the glue. Resist the urge to mess with it until the glue is mostly dried or you'll probably just end up making more of a mess than what you have now. Once that first coat of ballast dried, I came back and applied another thin coat of ballast to help even everything out, fill in any gaps or dips, or fix any other imperfections. I also added some green ground foam in places so I could glue that down along with the second coat of ballast. And like before, I sprayed things down with alcohol so the glue would soak in better, but you could just use water and a few drops of dish soap mixed in to act as a wetting agent as well. Then I applied another soaking of the glue mix. Another advantage of applying the ballast in two or three layers is that the extra glue that you're adding uh, kind of better ensures you're gonna get the full layer glued very solidly. The next day I worked on adding static grass and I mixed up several shades of green static grass in my applicator and then dabbed on full strength matte medium where I wanted the grass. Unfortunately, I forgot to hit record when doing that and applying the static grass, but the application is a simple process. Just touch the lead from the static grass applicator to the area you are trying to apply the grass to and shake the applicator over the area. The static charge will make the fibers stand on end, giving a realistic looking grass texture. 
Once everything had dried for an hour or so, I came back with a vacuum and picked up all the excess grass from the track, the walls, and the surrounding areas. I wanted to darken the areas between the rails to give the appearance of oil and grease having dripped and accumulated over the years, and so I used a black weathering powder and brushed that down the middle of the tracks. In the past, I've just made a thin wash of diluted black paint, and that worked great as well. I then wanted to work on adding some vines to the retaining walls, so I pulled out my bin of foliage and flocking material and grabbed a bag of the green leaf flake material. But inside of the bag, I found peanuts and seeds and everything else, and so apparently a mouse must have at some point found its way into the garage up onto the shelf with this bin and decided that this particular bag of leaf flake material was a great place to store some food. So that was pretty funny. Um, I didn't see it in any of the other bags, so I'm not really sure what made this particular bag of leaf flake material look like a great hiding spot for food, but there it was. Anyway, to make the vines, I took some tacky glue and painted on a vine type pattern on the retaining wall. Then I took a different bag of leaf flake material and tried to get as much of it as I could into the glue on the wall with my fingers by blowing it onto the wall, tossing it on the wall, and so on. And while doing that, I decided that I kind of liked how the extra material was piling up along the base of the wall, and so I just doubled down on that, spreading it along the entire length of the retaining wall. And this added to the ground foam that was already there along with the static grass, and it gave the appearance of a dense growth of weeds and vines. I repeated the process of making vines on the wall three more times and will probably come back and touch those up, maybe even add some more vines in different places once I'm done with more of the surrounding work. But I think it looks pretty good for now. Anyway, you can see here how everything looked after all the ballasting and scenery work was completed on this area of the layout. I do plan to extend the ballast work farther into the tunnel so you can't see the unballasted track, but I'll get to that at a later time. In this video, we're going to look at how I finished doing all the wiring on the 2 by 4 foot end scale project layout here. So I started by working on the push button controls for the turnouts on the middle level. I drew a line along the middle part of the fascia board and then just marked out an even spacing about an inch and a half apart for each of the push buttons. And you can see where I drew those there. And then I also traced out an area on the right hand side where the DC throttles needed to go. And that was an area I had to cut out and remove from the fascia board as well. So I started by making small pilot holes with my drill and then made those a little bit bigger with a secondary drill bit. And then I took my step bit and made nice smooth holes that were about three quarters of an inch across for each of the push buttons. Because the area of wood on the right hand side wasn't big enough to fully cover the area where I needed to put the DC controller, I basically at this point had planned to redo the entire front fascia board. And so as a result, I wasn't really too careful with how I removed the wood. So I basically just drilled holes all along the line that I needed to uh, cut and then just kept drilling larger and larger holes uh, in that area until I was able to basically pop out that section of wood. This made for a very messy cut essentially and I ended up actually breaking off uh, part of the top there. But anyway, once that was done, I had to use my Dremel to remove part of the wood on the inside as well. So I had to cut off part of my retaining wall as well as some of the base area there which was just again that eighth inch thick layer of plywood and then part of the foam. So I had a space big enough for the DC controller to fit. The next step was to drill holes for the toggle switches. So again, I just marked out spots where I wanted those switches to go, made the holes big enough for the toggle switch to fit through. But because the shaft isn't long enough to fit all the way through the three quarter inch thick fascia board, I had to chisel out part of the back like I did for the first toggle switch on the left hand side of the board. So here I just used my Dremel and cut a bunch of lines to make it easier to chisel out that part of the wood. So I had a recessed space for the toggle switch to fit. Again, didn't do a good job with this just because again, I planned to replace this entire fascia board eventually anyway, but I made it big enough to eventually fit the toggle switch in uh, securely. You can see here how the initial wiring on the fascia board looks. I connected wires to the input and output terminals of the DC throttles. And then I also connected wires to the push buttons and the toggle switches. For the push buttons, you just need one power lead going to all of them. So I daisy chained that power input to all the five buttons and then connected a wire for the output side from all five buttons that will then go to the controller. Uh, for the toggle switches, I have a pair of wires coming from each DC controller to one side of each toggle switch. And then I have 
output from the DCC board going to the other side of each toggle switch. And then the middle terminals of each toggle switch are the wires that will actually go to the two track loops, uh, one set going to each track loop on the lower level. To get those wires into the interior bay, I did have to remove the foam in a little channel behind the front fascia board and then drilled a hole into the interior bay area so I could fish all the wires up through there and then connect them to the control boards. You can see here what the front fascia board looks like with all the controls installed. And here it is again with another piece of wood installed on the right hand side to cover up the back end of the DC throttle. Okay, so I had my Digitrax DS74s pre-wired here. If you look at the directions, you can see your uh, switch machine controls go into these terminals here, this row right here. Uh, track power can come into here. You can either use track power or the uh, or DC input on the back to actually power everything. I'll be hooking it up to track power and that's all I'll need to do. I'm not gonna use the loco net cable because I'm just gonna be having push button controls of the turnouts. I'm not gonna be using the handheld DCC controller to operate the turnouts since they're all very easily reachable anyway. And the uh, pin connector here is what actually connects to your push buttons. And so the chart here shows you'll use brown, orange, green and violet along with the black for your common wire going to each of the push buttons. Everything else is not gonna be used in this application. So I basically hooked up all the wires to the cable here. I just cut off the wires I don't need. In this example here, I just need the brown one and that's it. And then the track power wires, I daisy chained to each of these units. Then I have wires going out, which I'll hook up to the DCC track power. And then all the other wires, I've added extension wires with heat shrink tubing to everything and then bundled those together with uh, additional heat shrink tubing to create a nice cable that can be hopefully kept relatively neat. And so I had to decide if I wanted to screw these to the bottom part of the layout or to the underside of the lid of the middle level. And, and that's what I'm going to do because there's fewer wires going down to the push buttons than there are coming from the turnouts. And so it's just less of a, a wiring mess if I have a cable going from the lid to the lower level rather than all the turnout wires going to the lower level. So uh, I'll screw these to the underside of the, the lid, hook up, hook up all the turnout wires to these terminals here. Just uh, I'll use all the terminals here and just two here because I have five turnouts. So you can only control four turnouts with each one of these units. I could have split it up like three and two as well, but I'm just doing four and one. And so now I'll go ahead and get this screw to the underside of the lid, hook up all the turnout wires to the DS74 units, and then get these cables ready to hook up to the push buttons, and we should be good to go. And so I'll be putting the DS74 units here, and the only thing is just to make sure that when the lid closes, they're going to be somewhere in this space here and aren't going to be hitting the... Uh, you know, the frame of this part of the layout. So that's the only thing to worry about. But there's plenty of space here, so that really shouldn't be a problem. And then all the turnout wires are right here. So it'll be easy to get those to the DS74 units right in this area. Okay, so you can see how I have everything set up here. I have the two DS74 units. These white wires, again, will go through this cable to the track power. Uh, I have all five turnouts connected here. And I have them in order of left to right front to back so this is the front left uh, front right and then back left back middle and back right turnout wires so the buttons will basically be in that same order so you can see the lower wiring here is a lot neater now i have three sets of terminal strips so on the left hand side this is for all the power going into the layout from the external AC adapter. So there's the one for the DCC controller, which is in the black and red. And then the yellow and green is going to the three DC throttles. And the last set of wires is the output from the DCC throttle. And that ends up going to all three loops. For these terminal strips here, I have this bundle here is all the wires for the push buttons. So I can disconnect them, pull them out if I want to pull the fascia board off, and then push the wires back through and reconnect them. And so this terminal strip here is the all the power going to the DC controllers and the output from them going to the various track loops. So uh, that's for these ones on the right-hand side over here. 
So this is the power going into the DC controllers. This is the power going out to each of the track loops. And these wires here coming in are the output from the DCC controller. And this goes to the toggle switches on the front of the layout. So these toggle switches will each take the output from the DCC controller and the output from one of these two DC controllers. And then they will swap those to the output wires, which go to these wires here. So that allows you to flip the toggle switch and determine which power is going to the actual track loops. I've also replaced a lot of the staples with these cable clips that I can unscrew. So if I need to remove these wires to service stuff, I can just unscrew those and that'll make it a lot easier to access the wires instead of having to pull out the staples. And I have a cable going from the middle here towards the front end down here. So when you close the lid, the wires will fold in front of that back wood panel here, which is a support for the middle level. So, And this board can't extend far enough back to stretch the wires any more than what they are. But I do have these clips here set up so uh, there is some slack in here and they can kind of turn a little bit to, to allow a little bit of additional slack if needed. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire installation of all the wiring since that's pretty dull work, but I did spend about five hours making a diagram of all the wiring that I did for this layout. So you can see here the schematic showing how all the wires are connected from the controllers to the various push buttons and toggle switches, uh, how they're all routed to the various terminal strips. But I, I basically have all the wire colors on this schematic matching what I have on the actual layout. And I plan to have a printed out copy of this mounted into the interior of the layout. So I have this reference here for what all the wires go to and what they all are. But this way I'll have this reference that matches all the wiring in the layout and that will make it a lot easier to troubleshoot any problems that might come up down the road. So the only thing I'm not showing here are all the actual connection points for the wires to the track loops. Each of the two lower loops have two sets of feeder wires, one on each side, while the middle loop has several sets of terminal wires, basically one in between every single turnout. So if a turnout fails to send power past it, there is another set of power leads beyond that point which can feed the track uh, you know, at that section. And so there's quite a few power leads in that middle level, but I didn't add all those wires here to this diagram just because that would really clutter it up. But uh, so I only show the one set of wires going to that middle level. But again, there's multiple points that uh, wires are connected to all feeding into that one line going down to the terminal strip there on the bottom level. I am going to have a copy of this schematic available on the website and there will be a link in the description to where you can view that if you want to study this a lot closer and see how all the wiring was done. Any place where I show the same color wire diverging at a 90 degree angle is a spot where those wires were connected and anywhere where I show one wire arcing over another wire that means there is not a connection there. In any place where two wires of different colors pass each other across each other uh, they are not connected. So. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments and I can try to answer that. Again, this isn't a perfect diagram by any means, but I did spend a lot of time on it trying to uh, make it as accurate as possible. But if you have any questions, do let me know in the comments below. You can see I finally have all the structures roughly assembled. So with the exception of the town buildings up on top, where I only modified, I think, two of them, everything else is kit bashed in one way or another. So overall, I have all these structures now roughly assembled and put in place. And the reason why I had to get everything assembled first in this kind of half-built state was so I could figure out exactly how all the roadways were going to work and I could work on getting those uh, bases installed and, and everything else kind of finished up for the structure placement once I have all of them done. So looking closer at this segment here, this will all be basically paved road area here through this middle section kind of curving through here. Now often in the past I've used things like plaster for the roadway materials, but I can't do that on this layout because this whole top half of the layout does lift up and the opening and closing of the lid would pretty much crack any plaster surface I had on the layout. And so this will all be built out of solid materials. So I'll likely use MDF for most of the roadway and structure base areas. And then for all the grade crossings, I'll likely use styrene since that will be a lot easier to work with. 
but at any rate, having a solid surface for the roadways is going to be critical on this layout to prevent damage over time. So now let's focus on the town area here. Okay, so I went through a lot of iterations here trying to figure out how I wanted to do these structures. Initially, I thought I was just going to have like a row on top and then a row on the bottom along this wall here with, with the road kind of going through here, but I didn't really like that. It was kind of, I don't know, boring looking to me. And so I decided to go ahead and have the road curve around from the bottom up to the top level like this. And so I cut some of my insulation foam board, produced that rough you know, elevation change there with the road, and then cut the bases here to sort of fit the structures that I plan to have here in the front. And then I'll have you know some stairs and kind of a ramp down and more stairs for like the sidewalk area to get to this lower level up here. And then I'll have my main street up here on top. I'll have another just wall here on this back side here to kind of give the impression that the town buildings keep going on beyond that point there. And you've probably noticed that I like to have these curving roads that go from one level to another on a lot of my layout projects. And the reason for that is just because, you know, visually, anytime you have a curving road that's changing in elevation and everything, it just draws your eye along it. So you can kind of use it to help tell a story with everything and in terms of when the viewer looks at your layout, how the eye moves through it and everything. So that's kind of the idea here. It'll just be a more visually interesting area to look at. And one thing with this top area, since it is removable, I can put everything on the workbench and work on it that way. But also that gave me the idea that I could just make this a fully self-contained layout by itself. That could be taken off, put on an end table, a desk, and just run that way. And so everything will be battery powered. I'll have controls built in maybe to the rooftops of the back structures in the back there. I'll be able to take that off. I'll have feet on the bottom. I can put that somewhere else. And then I'll have a module to put on top. That'll be like a forested hill. Just a very easy thing to, you know, kind of plop on there. But anyway, I think that should be a fun idea is to have a modular top section there that you can kind of swap out and change up the look of the layout. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I got these two structures installed, as well as this basic scenery done on this corner of the layout. You'll notice I also have retaining walls done. I have most of the road and concrete areas done as well, but that's going to be the subject of another video. So for this corner structure, I use the George Roberts Printing Company Walters Kit. And you can see from the picture on the box that structure wasn't going to fit the small corner space as it was designed for the kit. So I had to kit bash this and cut things down to size. So I laid everything out on my workbench and then just started trimming down pieces to fit the space that I had. For a lot of these, I would take a wall section, take it over to the actual place on the layout where it was going to go, and figure out the best place to cut it. I wanted to keep the wall panels pretty much whole so I didn't you know, have a cut in the middle of a window and that kind of thing. And so the way the kit is designed, there's those concrete support pillars with the brick panels in between. And so I wanted to make sure all the cuts were going to be in a logical place so it would look realistic once it was built. So here you can see all the wall panels once I had them cut down to size. So the next step was to sand down all the pieces and fit them together and then start gluing them. And so I started with the very front section, getting some of those pieces uh, sanded and glued together. And I just used some plastic bonding for the solvent to attach these wall panels together. So after the first few pieces for the front, I worked on one of the larger angled pieces getting that roughly glued in place. And then for the largest panel, I taped that in place onto the corner and then added some glue onto the interior of the joint. The structure at this point was still kind of floppy since I didn't have the one side uh, complete on it yet. And I decided to just use a piece of blank styrene for that wall side because that was going to face the exterior of the layout and be placed up against the wooden side of the layout. So there wasn't really any need to use an actual piece of the kit for that side. So I figured I might as well just use a piece of styrene and then save the remaining wall pieces from the kit so I could potentially use those on a later project. Now this wasn't going to be a perfect fit from the start and I knew that, but I wanted to get it roughly cut to size and then kind of work with it and get the final trimming done once I had everything at least partially assembled. I had to notch out one corner to fit the different elevations of the structure in that area and then got it to where it was pretty close to the proper size. I then taped all the pieces together and worked on getting some of the roof sections cut out as well. So for the small roof section on the front part of the layout, I used one of the actual roof sections from the kit, 
cut that out and then cut it down to size to fit that little square. And the main idea of doing this little one first was that because I wanted to have that as a almost perfect square, that would actually help obviously align all the wall sections to make sure I had 90 degree corners there and kind of set the stage for the remainder of the structure. So I got that piece cut and trimmed to size, put it in place, and then, and then applied solvent to securely attach it. With that first part done, I was able to go around and add a little bit more solvent on some of the joints to kind of get them stiffened up a little bit better. And then I placed the structure upside down on another piece of styrene so I could trace from the inside the outline of the roof section for the main part of the structure. Then I just cut out along my lines I had traced and I had a roof that was pretty much the proper size. And I had to make some very slight trims to get everything to fit properly, but once I did, everything fit almost perfectly and I was able to get that glued in place, which obviously dramatically increased the overall strength of the structure. I used some tape to help hold everything tightly together as I applied the adhesive and then let that stay on there for a while as everything dried. To strengthen each of the corners, I just took leftover pieces of sprue, cut them down to size, and placed them in each of the corners to help really strengthen the overall structure. Now the construction of this building, as you see it at this point, actually occurred three months before I'm editing this video, and I couldn't seem to find all the video of me doing the original painting for the structure. So I'm showing you a reenactment of me spraying everything with black paint and then brushing on the gray paint that I used for the original mortar color. So here's a structure with that grayish mortar color already painted on the entire structure. And so then I mixed up a couple colors of brown and maroon to make the brick color that I wanted. And then I just took a brush and almost dry brushed everything. It was obviously heavier than a dry brushing would be, but I did get a lot of the paint off the brush. And so I was just gently sweeping it across the structure walls to try to highlight the tops of the bricks, but not get the paint into the mortar joints. Overall, I think this technique worked out a little bit better than the ones I used for my other structures where I painted the brick color first and then applied a thin wash for the mortar. Next, I had to paint all the concrete pillar sections for the structure. So I mixed up a couple colors of gray, a little bit of kind of a tan color, tried that and it was a little bit too yellowish looking for me. So I added more gray until I kind of got it to the color that I wanted. And then I just hand brushed all of the concrete areas on this structure. Now I could have just masked off all the brick areas and spray painted it. Uh, however, I decided that I didn't really want to do all the masking because there'd be a lot of cutting. And the way the structure is designed with the brick areas recessed below those concrete pillar areas, it would be pretty easy to paint by hand just because if you just slid the brush kind of sideways along those pillar areas, you wouldn't really get the brush on the bricks because there was a little bit of an elevation difference. So it was pretty easy to hand paint all those concrete pillar areas on the structure all the way around. And you can see here pretty much how that came together. So with the painting done, it was time to work on details. So I recently had a video on this Kokoni 3D printer and I used that to make all of the roof and wall details that I used on the structure. So I did all kinds of roof vents, HVAC units, wall vents, electrical boxes, power meters, all those types of details. And I added those onto the structure in different places. So you can see the electrical boxes, the, the wall vent there, all the roof vents, and the different HVAC units on top of the roof to, to kind of really round out the structure and, and have that roof detail that you would expect on a structure like this. So you couldn't see through the structure. I just used some black construction paper, cut it to size, and then place that inside the interior of the structure so you couldn't look through from one side to the other. And so here you can see it glued in place on the layout. I just used some wood glue on the structure. The one wall that is up against the wood side of the layout was glued quite thoroughly. And then I just put glue along the other back side, which was next to the retaining wall and the various base edges and pretty much just stuck that in place, added some weights on top to hold it in place while the glue dried and it was good. So the other structure I got in place was one that I had showed a video on uh, quite some time ago, and that was another kit bashed uh, Walther's kit. And so this one I had already cut to size, but I needed to get those retaining walls done first before I could glue that structure in place. So since I had finished the retaining walls, and again, I'll have a video on that coming up along with the roads, um, I was able to glue that structure in place. To make the structure a little more solid, I filled the entire interior of the structure with pieces of foam. So I just put a bunch of wood glue on the base of it, along with the edges, and then just put that in place on the layout. To make sure everything would stay secure while the glue was drying, I added different weights to different parts of the structure, and then wiped up any of the excess glue that was oozing out from the edges. There was still a gap along the back of the structure between 
the roof and the retaining wall. And so I just took some pieces of styrene and cut those to size so I could put those along that back edge and hide the gap that was in place there. I glued those in place with some super glue and then just added more weights to the structure until everything was fully dry. And while the glue was drying, I decided to paint all the rail for this front side of the layout. So I just used some rail tie brown and painted all the rails on this front section of the layout and then wiped off the excess paint from the tops of the rails with some alcohol wipes once I had finished painting that area of rail. At this point, the glue on the structure was pretty much dry, so I just took all the weights off and painted those styrene strips that I use as a filler in the back. I used a gray color that was more or less a close match to the roof color of the structure. I decided at this point to complete the scenery on this corner of the layout, so I brushed on some full strength white glue along the edges of the Kato Unitrack, as well as the surrounding wood areas, so I could put down my base layers of scenery. And I realized at this point that when I was putting in the scenery along the edges of the first structure in the corner there that the glue had actually seeped down and sealed that section of the lid to the bottom part of the layout. So I had to take a knife and cut through that joint so I was able to actually lift up the lid. And so that wouldn't happen again. I just took some painter's tape and put that in place along the edge of the top lid so, so none of the glue would seep between that and the bottom edge of the layout gluing the top down to the bottom. So with that done, I poured on a layer of my dirt mix that I typically use and then added on ballast and then some ground foam along that whole area there. I sprayed everything down with some rubbing alcohol and then added on a diluted mix of matte medium to glue everything thoroughly in place. Now while I was cutting through that joint there in the corner, I did, with my hand, end up bumping out one of the windows on that corner section of the structure. And so I decided to just cut that roof section off and so I wouldn't knock out any more windows in that section. I took some pieces of foam, wrapped it in black tape, and then just stuffed it down that front part of the structure so it would be pressing up against the window pane. So if you press in on the windows, you might still break the joint, but there wouldn't be space for them to fully push in and fall into the interior of the structure. So with that done, I put the roof section back in place, added more solvent, clamped everything down, and let everything dry and everything was pretty much the way it was originally. And then to finish out that scene, I came back and added some pieces of fine leaf foliage and as, and as well as a few more clumps of grass around that structure and kind of finish out that scene in the corner of the layout. Trying to figure out how to finish the rooftops of your model structures? And are you looking for a cheap and easy way to do it? Well, you might consult your friend, Mr. Google McDougall, and print out some imagery that you find from Google Maps. So for this structure here, all I did was go on Google Maps. I found an industry near where I live that had a rooftop that I liked. I did a screenshot of the image from my web browser printed it out on my laser printer, cut it to size, and stuck it on this structure, and it looks pretty good. I did add some weathering powders to kind of blend it in to the actual structure itself, but I have now a nice looking roof texture that uh, was very easy and effectively free, besides the cost of paper and toner to produce. Anyway, let's look at the process in a bit more detail. Okay, so I have the different roof textures I printed out. I have the ones that came from Google Maps, and I have some of these Team Track model textures as well that uh, I had downloaded and printed out. Because these were all, I think, like $1.99 a piece, and so you can print out as many as you want. I'm gonna go through and try a few different ones out on this structure here, see which one I like better. Just gonna trace the roof out. So we have that, and I can add roof details on here and do something like that. So that would be a possibility as well. All right, so I've cut out various roof textures here. I have my two Google ones, my two Team Track model ones. I can kind of decide what I like better on here. The colors on this one I think are nice, but the uh, blurriness of it is, I think, a problem. This one I think is too bluish. This Google one I think works pretty well. This one I kind of like as well. What I'm gonna try doing first is doing a bit of weathering on here. We just apply some weathering powders on here. So 
So I like that quite a bit, actually. I decided I'm gonna go ahead and use this uh, Google texture that I printed out here to attach it. I'm just gonna use some matte medium. You could use white glue, but it's a little bit um, harder to get a smooth coating with, with the white glue unless you kind of dilute it. I'll actually go ahead and put some on top as well. I just made some mess. That's really getting wrinkly. <laughs> well, failure on the first try. So spray adhesive would work really well on this, but I just don't want to use that right now. So I'm gonna try using a glue stick. Okay, now let's try weathering this sun. I think that at least blends in with this structure okay. I'm gonna go ahead and add on rooftop details now. So anyway, this idea is not by any means new, not anything I came up with by far. Uh, many other modelers have done this as well, but I've never done it myself. And so I, just, I decided since I have a lot of rooftops to do, I might as well try doing that. So overall, I think it works really well. Obviously you have to find structures that are gonna work well for what you need, not just in terms of you know how it looks, but if there's a lot of items on the roof with shadows, that can be a problem. So you have to kind of find a rooftop that has a larger area without a lot of shadows on it. Now you could just cover up all the shadows with rooftop details and that kind of thing too, so that's an option, but you do have to kind of find something that at least is going to be workable for your model in terms of not being too much of a pain to kind of adapt uh, before you print it out and stick it on there. So anyway, this worked really well. So if you are looking to make some rooftops for your structures besides just painting them or gluing on some other rooftop material, this is a nice option and certainly a good one if you're looking to model any more modern structures where you already have the imagery readily available at your fingertips on Google Maps or another mapping software. So today I'm going to show you how I built all the roads on this 2 by 4 foot and scale layout. Okay, first let's look at this upper section that I built which has a small town area with a road that curves down from a higher to a lower area. And for a road like this, it's usually easier to build it out of plaster or a material like that because you can control the slope and varying width and you know shape of the road a lot easier using plaster. You can still build a road like this with styrene or another material, but it's just a lot harder to get everything cut to the exact right shape when you have a complex uh, shape like this one. But before I could build the road surface, I needed to build the road base. And in this case, that was a piece of foam that I cut to the general size to give the slope and shape that I needed to fit around the structures I plan to install. For the actual road surface, I just used some joint compound because I already had that on hand, but you could use another plaster like Woodland Scenic Smooth It or something along those lines. Before starting on the road surface, I installed some of my retaining walls, but I didn't want to show you that because it was top secret. Well, actually, I just can't find the footage, but what I did was use some chipboard for most of the retaining walls. That's kind of the cardboard you see on the back of a notepad, something like that. And then I used a curved piece of styrene along the roadway, since it's a little bit easier to cut and bend the styrene than the chipboard. Installing the road surface was just a matter of taking the joint compound and smoothing it all over the areas where I wanted to have roads or other base areas and also to fill in all the gaps along the retaining walls. Once I got that first coat of plaster on, I used some wood filler and spread that along the edges of the retaining walls to help lock them in place since wood filler dries very hard and it's very easy to work with and kind of 
gets put on pretty much like a caulk. Now for the top area, which is just totally flat, I just used a piece of styrene for the road base area, and that served as the roadway for the entire top area. And later I would add on the areas for the sidewalks and the structure bases. I just cut this first layer to the proper shape and then cut a hole for the wires here that go to the tracks. And the wires come through this top area because I plan to have the controls for this little top area mounted inside two of the structures on that back corner. And to attach the styrene, I just spread a layer of tacky glue on the entire surface of the styrene, pushed it in place, and then added some weights to hold it while the glue set. Then I took more of the plaster to smooth out the transition from the curved road area to the flat area on top, and then also went ahead and filled in some of the low spots on the remaining road sections. And while that was drying, I worked on the other structure base areas. I cut one out for this middle level here, glued that in place with some tacky glue, and then glued on some additional retaining walls around that middle level. Next, I glued on the base areas for the lower structures. And again, that wasn't just the base for the structures, but also served as the sidewalk areas for that lower section. I did need a sidewalk area to go from that lower section to the upper level, and so I worked on adding some stairs in a few different areas. For the top one, I had to shim up the staircase that I used, which came from a Walther's kit, by adding on two thin layers of styrene underneath it to bring it up to the proper height. I then added on two more staircases lower down to complete this curved ramp and staircase area going from the upper level to the lower level. Next, it was just a matter of sanding the road area smooth, adding on another skim coat of plaster, and then repeating that process much like doing drywall joints. I probably added four or five thin coats of the joint compound along with light sandings in between each coat to get the roadway area smooth enough to my liking. Now for the top part of this upper section, I added on two more pieces of styrene to serve as a sidewalk and structure base areas. Here you can see how the overall road and sidewalk areas were shaping up. Now I used some more wood filler against the retaining walls in the back as well as along the edge of the road on the bottom here to protect the edge of the plaster road from chipping every time I try to remove or reinstall this upper section of the main layout. At this point, it was time to do the painting, and I painted the main structure base areas a concrete gray color, and that was just a mix of gray colors to kind of give a rough general concrete color for those structure base areas and sidewalks, and I used the same paint on the retaining walls as well. Next, I mixed up some chalk gray paint as well as a medium gray paint in an attempt to produce an asphalt-like tone of gray. I painted that on the asphalt roadway areas and then just used a small brush to get the paint into all the edges along the sidewalk and structure base areas, as well as along the edges of the retaining walls. Once I finished this first coat of paint, I needed to clean off the tops of the rail heads, and I realized I needed to push the plaster down a little bit along the edges of the rails. Otherwise, every time I tried to clean the rails off, I would end up rubbing the paint off the adjoining road areas. So I used a flathead screwdriver and just ran that along each side of each rail to help scrape away and push down the plaster about a millimeter or so along each side of the track. I was then able to touch up the paint in those areas and a few other places on the upper section to pretty much finish the painting. But the gray color just didn't look quite right. And so I came back and later painted things a darker gray color, which you can see here. Now this didn't look right either, but the idea was that if I made it darker, I could lighten everything with some weathering powders and kind of eventually get the color I wanted. And so to do that, I use these pan pastels, these weathering powders I've had for years, and I really like using them. Uh, they go on really nicely and they adhere really well. So I used a couple gray colors and a grimy black color and just more or less scrubbed those into the painted surface. And the pan pastels, again, adhere really well, but you might spray on a coat of dull coat or some other kind of sealer if you are worried about them wearing off over time. But as you can see, I used the lighter grays to help lighten up the color of the road and the grimy black color to help simulate those darker streaks you see down the middle of each lane on a roadway. And eventually I had a roadway that I was pretty much happy with, and I think it looks like a reasonable approximation of an asphalt road. Now, road markings, cracks in the pavement, signs, all that kind of stuff, that will all be the subject of another video. I did use the same weathering powders on the retaining walls, as well as all the sidewalk and structure-based areas to kind of blend everything together and make everything look more or less similarly old and aged. 
And with all that done, it was time to work on some of the surrounding scenery. First, I painted the rails with something along the lines of a burnt umber color, and then I scraped off the rail heads with a piece of wood before moving on to the rest of the scenery. I ran a bead of white glue along the track and put on a first layer of ballast, which I smoothed out with a paintbrush, and then added some dirt along the edges of the retaining wall. I sprayed everything down with isopropyl alcohol as a wetting agent, soaked everything with a diluted mix of matte medium to secure it in place, and then when that was dry, I came back and did a second layer of everything. I also added on some ground foam during this next layer along the edges of the retaining wall and on the outside edge of the track. I secured the ballast and ground foam in place and then added some ground foam here and there along the edges of the retaining walls and other spots on the upper level to kind of finish up that initial coating of scenery. And so you can see here that this roadway area was pretty much complete at this point. Again, the road details still need to be done and that'll be covered in a different video, but overall the roadway surface itself was more or less done on this upper level. So it was time to move on to the middle level of the layout, doing the roadway there and the structure base areas. And for this part of the layout, I used a completely different technique since it was pretty much just one big flat surface. So I decided to try using gator board. And I've never actually used gator board before. It looks pretty much just like a regular foam core board. And if you didn't actually hold it, you would be hard pressed to tell which was which. But instead of basically two sheets of poster board with a layer of foam in between, the gator board is actually two thin plies of wood with foam in between. So basically it's like a ply of plywood on either side of that middle layer of foam. And that makes it extremely strong. And here I'm stacking up batteries on this one quarter inch piece to show you how strong the board is. It's actually 13 pounds of batteries on the right hand side of that board. Plus obviously a lot more on the other side as a counterweight. And the board bends, but it just doesn't break. Anyway, all I did was to cut pieces of the gator board to size to fit along the tracks and to cover all the road and structure base areas on this part of the layout. I just used wood glue to attach everything in place after I cut them to size and just stuck them down and held them down with some batteries to serve as weights. And then once everything had dried, because I like wood filler so much, I used it to blend in the edges of all the base areas with the surrounding scenery. I also used it to fill in the seams and gaps between the individual pieces of gator board to help blend everything together. I sanded all the wood filler smooth once it had dried and then moved on to working on the grade crossings. And for those, I just made those using thin pieces of styrene. And what I did was to cut the styrene pieces to size to fit all the grade crossing areas I needed to do, including the pieces between the rails. But I needed to blend all those into the surrounding gator board itself. And I could have just glued them in place and then used more wood filler or putty to kind of blend in the styrene to the gator board uh, base areas themselves. But I decided to actually try cutting off that top layer of wood on the gator board so everything would be a little bit more smooth and even in the transitions. So I placed each piece of styrene where I needed it and used that as a template to cut through the top layer of wood veneer on the gator board around the edge of that styrene piece. Then I just sliced off that top layer and that gave me just the right amount of recess to accommodate the top piece of styrene. And I used a combination of wood glue and super glue to attach the styrene pieces and mainly just use a super glue where the styrene was only being attached directly to the track itself, such as between the rails. And once the glue had set, I used more wood filler once again to smooth out the transition between the styrene and the gator board. I sanded all those areas smooth once the wood filler had dried. And here you can see everything installed and ready for paints. So next I taped off the rails and sprayed everything with both a gray and a light tan colored spray paint. I was trying to, to achieve subtle variation in color and kind of a modeling texture with the two courses of paint kind of going back and forth from one color to the other. But for the road itself, I plan to again have that be more of an asphalt look. So I, once the paint had dried, I masked off the areas for the roadway and painted those a darker gray color. And then after pulling the tape surrounding the road, I took a smaller brush and reworked those edges to have a nice sharp dividing line between the road and the concrete areas. And once the paint was dry, I again broke out my supply of weathering powders and went to work weathering the road and concrete areas with a mix of gray, black, and earth colored powders pretty much like I did on the top section. And everything does look a little bit goofy here with the weathering, but just keep in mind that most of this will be covered up by structures. And so I wasn't trying to actually weather everything evenly across all of the entire base areas. 
And you can see here that everything looks quite a bit better once the structures are in place. And finally, I wanted to do a bit of scenery work down here as well. And so I painted some glue on top of these little raised curb areas I had installed to divide the road area from the parking areas. I sprinkled on some ground foam and then applied some static grass. And then after vacuuming off the excess, I decided to start adding on some of the fences as well. I use these easy to install Woodland Scenics fence kits for which you just need to drill a hole where each of the posts go, apply some glue, and then attach the fence sections. But in practice, you're gonna end up breaking off probably half of those fence posts since they're just thin pieces of styrene. And so make sure you have enough glue on the bottom edge of the fence to help secure it in place if you end up doing that. And probably it's almost just easier to cut off all those little plastic pins and then just glue them directly in place using glue on the bottom edge of the fence sections. And so anyway, with that, you can see I now have most of the infrastructure done on the layout. Cars keep going over the retaining wall and crashing into my tram. Boy, this road really needs some guardrails. So this guardrail was a very simple project to build. I just used three sections of half round and a piece of H column for the post for this guardrail. But anyway, I just placed two of those pieces of half round side by side and then used some plastic bonding solvent to attach them. And once I had dried for a few seconds, I flipped it over, put more of the solvent on the back and attached the third piece of half round in the middle of those uh, first two to create the overall profile. Once I had finished attaching those three pieces together, I set that aside and started working on chopping up pieces of H column for the posts. The exact size of these doesn't really matter so much because I'll be having holes for each of the posts to go into and I can just push them in or pull them out as far as I need so all the heights are even on the final guardrail. So I just picked a rough size and kind of got them all more or less the same size as I cut them up and cut enough so I would have enough posts for the entire guardrail section. So I started out by gluing these sections of H column to my guardrail about one and a half centimeters apart. And then after I did this, I realized that this was actually probably a bad idea. And it's going to be kind of hard to make sure I get all the holes lined up on the layout, the exact same spacing. And so I ended up pulling all of them off of the guardrail. So at this point I decided it was a good time to put on a first coat of paint. And so I painted the guardrail a mix of silver and gunmetal and the same thing with all the little post sections. So once that paint was dry, I just used a dab of super glue in each of the holes I had poked along the edge of the road where the guardrail was going to go and pushed in the pieces of H column so they were all roughly the same heights. Now to help curve the guardrail at the ends, like you typically see, I used a lighter to soften the plastic, although the first attempt I actually set it on fire, so I had to put that out and cut off that piece of guardrail. And then uh, I kept the heat a little bit farther away to soften the plastic, but not start melting it completely or catching it on fire. Then I was able to bend a little curve on each end of the guardrail to kind of get that curve on the end. So then I started out by gluing the first three posts onto the guardrail using some super glue and I used a spray of the Instaset to help get that cured right away to help hold those ends in place securely while I worked on the remaining sections. Then it was just a matter of adding a dab of glue to each of the posts and pushing the guardrail in place. To help make sure the guardrail stayed in place, I just took my one, two, three blocks and pushed them against the guardrail to help hold the guardrail up against the posts as I went along. Then I touched up the glue in a couple spots and made sure everything was held in place and then waited for that to dry and came back and everything looked pretty good. So at this point I decided I might as well do some scenery work as well. So I dabbed on some tacky glue and then applied a static grass mix to that area, both along the base of the retaining wall as well as along the guardrail itself where you would typically see weeds growing through along those posts. I also added a piece of fine leaf foliage to the uh, corner there, and then I applied some alcohol and some diluted matte medium across the grass I had already applied. So I could add a second layer of static grass and a darker green texture that was also a little bit longer, so I would have more variety of color and texture in the grass. I vacuumed up the excess and then added some medium green coarse ground foam from Woodland Scenics to all the areas along the base of the retaining wall and some other patches here and there to just represent weeds and small shrubs and that kind of thing. I soaked that with alcohol and diluted matte medium to secure it in place, and then moved along to the final section I hadn't completed yet. And with that, my guardrail project was complete. Anyway, I hope this video showed you that scratch building a guardrail is very easy to do, and maybe this will give you an idea for your own layout.
so now cars won't go over the retaining wall and crash into my passing tram. Well, I guess bad drivers will still be bad drivers. The 2x4 foot end scale layout finally has a backdrop which really makes the layout look a lot better. Before I could work on the backdrop panels themselves, I needed to paint the backdrop a hazy sky color. So I mixed together some bare etched glass and ethereal mood colors that I had on hand as these sample paints were left over from when we were deciding on some paint colors for a room a couple of years ago. I mixed them in roughly equal amounts and then painted a couple coats on the backdrop. For the backdrop panels themselves, I first started with the one featuring a retaining wall. I initially measured out the retaining wall I wanted to build on a piece of chipboard and then cut that out. Next, I cut a thin strip of chipboard to glue to the top of the retaining wall, and because I also wanted some shrubs and such on top of the retaining wall, I cut another piece of chipboard that was a little bit taller than the retaining wall itself and cut a slightly wavy pattern so it would have some variation along the top edge. I then glued those two pieces together and applied a bead of tacky glue along the top edge of the retaining wall to attach that thin strip of the chipboard. And then I used an extra piece of chipboard to kind of just help push everything in place. Now finally, I used the back of a hobby knife to score some vertical lines in the retaining wall that were about one ruler width apart, so the wall would have the appearance of being made up of individual panels. I then added some weight and let everything dry. And while that was drying, I cut out four more pieces of chipboard with one side of each panel having an undulating pattern. And these would be the other backdrop panels for the layout. I actually only needed three of them, uh, but I cut out four to have an extra. I painted all the areas that were to be covered with ground foam a green color, although a darker color would have actually worked out better here. You know, something closer to a very dark green, almost black color. Once the green paint was dry, I masked off the green area on the retaining wall panel and used a chalk gray paint to paint the retaining wall portion of that panel. And when the paint had dried, it was time to apply the flocking materials. I mainly used Woodland Scenics medium green fine leaf foliage and medium green coarse turf, although I used some light green as well. I started with the retaining wall section and painted on a layer of glue. Then I broke off small pieces of the fine leaf foliage and stuck those in place. Next, I covered everything with a layer of the medium green coarse foam. Finally, I secured everything in place by dribbling on rubbing alcohol as a wetting agent and then some diluted white glue. Before I worked on the other panel sections, I cut them to size to fit the areas where I plan to install them. Then I painted them with a coat of glue and sprinkled on a layer of coarse ground foam. Then I came back and layered on pieces of fine leaf foliage and proceeded to attach everything with a soaking of rubbing alcohol and diluted glue. After that first coat of glue was in place, I sprinkled on another layer of the medium green coarse ground foam and then some of the light green, kind of like I was making a pizza, a yummy green foam pizza. Everything was then soaked with more alcohol and glue mix and then set aside to dry. Before installing the panels, I decided to weather the retaining wall with my pan pastel weathering powder since it would be easier to do at the workbench. I used a grimy black, a gray, and a brown and brushed them onto the wall until I had a look that I liked. Now installing the panels on the layout itself is a simple process. I just spread some wood glue on the back of the retaining wall panel, pushed it in place, and then held it in place with some clamps while the glue dried. I glued on the panel for the short side of the layout and then glued on the corner structure and finally the other panel for the long side of the layout. At this point, I could finish the scenery between the track and the wall panels. I painted on some glue, applied ballast, dirt, ground foam, smoothed everything out with a brush and then glued everything down with my usual diluted glue mix. I also put a little of the coarse ground foam right up against the bottom of the wall panels to kind of help hide that joint. Now here you can see how everything looks. In a previous video, I built a removable section of scenery for this front corner of the layout, and so I covered that with some plastic wrap and then worked on the scenery around it. But after a while, I decided to just scrap the idea of that scenery section since it made it hard to see the cars on the interchange track, and most of the time when you're operating, you wouldn't want to have it in place. And while you can remove it pretty easily, every time you remove it, you are going to cause a little bit of damage to it, so I figured it was just better to remove completely. So I added a small grassy hill instead. And so to do that, I glued down a piece of foam and then spread some wood filler around the perimeter of the foam to blend it into the surrounding base area. 
And once that had dried, I painted everything with a brown paint, poured on some white glue while the paint was still wet, spread that around, and then covered everything with dirt and ground foam. I soaked everything with the diluted white glue and then immediately came back with the static grass applicator and coated everything with a layer of static grass. At this point, I added more glue to the other areas I wanted static grass and applied static grass to those areas as well. And so here you can see the layout with the basic scenery work completed, including the painted backdrop and all of the completed scenery wall panels. I could have probably done a little bit better with them, but I think they look pretty good overall and it really makes a big difference to have a backdrop around the layout instead of just those bare wood sides. Okay, so the legs on this 2x4 foot project layout were always meant to be temporary. I've used these on multiple projects. I can kind of screw them on, take them off. Makes it easy to move the layout around, but the layout's almost done. And so I thought it was time to upgrade the legs. But anyway, before I get these unwrapped and installed on the layout, I have to get everything off of it that isn't glued down. So let's do that first. Okay, so this is a 24 inch wide layout. These legs are like 23 and three quarter inches wide, so I really hope they fit. So there's a lot of debris in here sliding around kind of like in a rain stick, and it has holes for adjustable feet, which are really important and why I picked these legs, because I want to be able to level the layout so the cars don't just start rolling on their own. But anyway, these holes are such that you can't really get the debris out of them because they're raised up a little bit on the inside. So unless I drill a hole up on top here, I can't really get that debris out. I might do that eventually. I don't really care that much. You're not really gonna hear it, except when you're you know, doing this and that's not gonna be something you do very much. But you know, something to think about. I mean, again, they were cheap, about $100 for the set. So I can't complain too much. And I think they look, you know, for the most part, okay. So let's see if these guys will actually fit on the layout. Oh, just perfect. All right, so that's gonna work well, I think. So these are big and chunky legs, but I think they'll work out okay. They do give you these adjustable feet, which I think are on a 3 8 inch bolt, and you could probably get uh, casters as well that would screw in if you do wanna be able to still wheel it around. Before I can screw these legs in place, I do need to add a piece of wood here. I'll just use a piece of one by pine and cut that so it basically fills this space here. So I have a little bit more material to actually screw these legs into. And so here you can see what the bottom of the layout looks like with those two pine boards installed. I just glued them in place with some wood glue and then tacked them in with a few brads as well to help hold everything in place while the glue dried. Okay, now I'll get these screwed on. I'm just using some regular wood screws. I'll go ahead and use something a little nicer and, uh, and bigger when I do this permanently. But I'll be taking these legs off multiple times as I work on the layout. And so I'm not going to worry about that right now. All right, so now I'll just drill some pilot holes, get some screws in here. I'm not gonna put the full number of screws in now because I'll be taking these legs on and off probably multiple times uh, while I work on the layout, but I'll get everything at least reasonably secured so everything will be pretty stable, at least for now. Anyway, some new legs for the 2x4 foot layout. This should add quite a bit more stability to this layout. Okay, so all these structures for the 2x4 foot layout are all functionally complete. They all have some random details and things left to do, but you can see they're all pretty much ready to go. 
all the painting is done, you know, the windows, the roofs, you know, some roof details, all of that is done on these structures. The only thing left to do, I am going to do some like photo inserts behind the, uh, the front windows here on these town structures, but I'm still trying to find the ones that I like the best. And so I haven't actually installed those yet, but uh, overall that's the only thing left to do on all of these structures. So let's take a look at all these and I'll give you a rundown of how I actually did them. This structure here is a kit bash. In, fa in fact, all of the uh, industry buildings are all kit bashes. They're all modified kits. I didn't build any of them the way, you know, the instructions said essentially, like they're not following the actual structure footprint. But I kind of look at most of the kits like this as, you know, kind of like a Lego set. You're, you have parts, you can put them together however you want. And so that's pretty much what I do. So, but anyway, let's look at how I did these structures. These DPM kits are, really nice, but they can be a challenge to do in end scale. So, you know, all, all the windows are molded in. And so that does present a challenge. And so I was going to do a video on how I did all the painting of these. And I, I, just, I just couldn't, <laughs> it just didn't work out. And so I'm not going to do that video. So I'll just kind of show you a few tips and I'll show you why I couldn't do the video. So the way I paint these is pretty much exactly like this. And it, it's, it's really hard to film that. I can't, trying to actually paint this to where I can have it in focus on the camera and you know be able to actually do it well, it's just really hard. Even though I have progressive lenses, it's just, it's just hard to do. I couldn't, it, it, it was just not gonna work out. And so we'll just talk about it. So the way I do these structures, and this one here came out the best, I think, in terms of how the bricks looked. And I'll try to do some better close-ups than what you're seeing here. But I painted all these structures first with a rattle spray can, you know, to get the general base brick color that I wanted. So once the base coat of paint was dry, I brushed on a light gray acrylic paint that was a, a very thin wash, has some alcohol in there too, I think. And so basically it would try to get into all the little crannies between the bricks and look like mortar. The next step at that point was I was painting all of the windows with a similar light gray color paint. And one thing I do when I paint windows on these DPM kits is I try to keep the contrasts lower between the detail parts and the bricks and everything else. Because if you make a mistake, it's not as obvious. And what I like to do most of the time is to use the same color for the mortar on the windows themselves if I'm painting the windows, you know, like a whiter type color. And so, you have the same color gray. And the advantage of that is that when you're painting the windows, if that paint starts kind of like seeping into the brick mortar joints, it's fine because it's the same color as the paint that's already there. Now, one thing, you're still gonna make mistakes. I still make a ton of mistakes when I'm painting these windows. But what I can do then is take another brush, I'll dip it in some alcohol, and then brush that along the area where the mistake is and kind of try to wash off the mistake as soon as I can and kind of basically just smear that paint into the surrounding brick, essentially making a thin wash of it. And it works really well. And then you get this clear uh, acetate for doing the windows with these DPM kits. And some of them I use as testers glue for clear parts and that works okay. You can still see it in spots and I, and I still have some that are not perfect because of that. But for a lot of them, what I dislike to do is use double-sided tape. And I had a video on this probably like seven years ago. I don't know, it's a long time on how I install that clear acetate using double-sided tape. And so all I do is I just basically put tape on the inside of a structure, you know, not where the window is, but on all the other empty spaces, tear off pieces, stick them all over. And then I stick on the clear acetate, but once it bonds and you squeeze on the acetate, it's not coming off. I mean, it's really strong. And so the nice thing is that you're not gonna have any glue run into the window and look bad or anything like that. So it works really, really well. And then for most of these, what I did was I printed out various window blinds and things like that online, just stuff like this. And then I cut them out and stuck them to the inside. So you have all the windows are covered with blinds or drapes or something like that. And in this way, I don't have to worry about interior details. I did use this clear testers glue for clear parts to attach all of these window blinds. Basically, I actually just put glue around the window and stuck it in there. And because it does dry clear and it does absorb into the paper, you get a fairly uniform looking window there. You don't, you don't end up seeing globs of glue and stuff like that. So it works pretty well. 
So anyway, that's what I did for all these. The, the rooftops are all printed off of Google Maps. Again, for the other structures I showed how I found rooftops on Google Maps, just did a screen capture and printed them out. And that's what I did for all of these too. So here, here's one of the rooftops. This is actually a warehouse roof, but I, I just used these because they were big. So it would be easy to fit all of these rooftops. I also have a bunch of these Blair Line signs and I don't remember exactly which ones these came from. They had like a whole bunch of sign packs and I have, I probably bought most of them. And so I, I just cut out signs for each of these structures too. So there would be a sign on them, you know, to indicate what type of, you know, business was working in each of these uh, structures. So, so that's pretty much it, how I did all these, all these rooftop details and all of them are 3D printed. I had a video a while back on that little 3D printer I got. I've printed out all kinds of rooftop details with that printer. And so that's what all of these are that I have on these structures. In this video, we're gonna look at how I use this little blue line snail controller to control the top level of this layout. So anyway, these little blue line controllers are fairly inexpensive. They're like about $38 uh, last time I looked. Uh, very simple to use. You have four terminals on the back, two for power in and two for power out. You could use a regular plug-in wall, you know, DC transformer for the power for one of these things, but I'm just using a nine volt battery attached to this. And then you just have two terminals for your track power and you're pretty much ready to go. So very simple installation. These are panel mounted though. And so you do have to take a piece of styrene or wood and drill holes. So you have these controls poking through there, but that's not that hard to do. And I'll show you how I did that here with the upper level of this layout. So anyway, you can see here are the controls for the upper level of this layout. This structure here is just press fit onto a piece of foam. There's a nine volt battery there on the bottom. And you can also just pull off this top part here and access the battery that way. And I can just press fit that back in place, turn the toggle switch to one of the directions. We'll go the other way, adjust the speed and you're ready to go. So again, the reason I have this battery powered is that this top layer here is removable and it's removable so you can have access to the track here if there is a derailment. But I also made it so you could take it off, put it on a table or desk and make it its own display layout and have it running when it's not derailed, you know, somewhere else in the house. Of course, remember for this layout, I built a forested hill that you can drop in place where that top section of the layout went. So if you do want to remove the town scene and put it somewhere else, you can drop in the forested hill and your layout still looks complete. So it's a very simple installation and let's look at how I did it. The way I'm doing this is I'm going to have the controllers here inside of this structure here. I cut a hole in the roof and this is actually two layers of styrene on top. I also put extra layers of styrene around the walls. So this is a pretty sturdy structure and there shouldn't be any problems with having the controls in the roof. Then I hot glued this piece of foam, which is cut to size to fit snugly inside of this structure. And then it's just a matter of press fitting the structure over that piece of foam, which keeps it nice and secure, but you can still remove it if you need to. For the controls, I'm using this blue line snail controller. I've used these on other projects in the past. They're pretty straightforward, pretty simple to use. For the controls on the roof of this structure, I cut out two layers of styrene, glued them together, uh, cut the holes for the controllers. So everything will fit through there pretty much like so. And so this will just fit snugly on top of the roof here. Kind of just press fit in place. And then you can use this toggle switch here to control on, off, and direction. And then this will be the speed control here. And uh, overall, a pretty straightforward operation with this blue line snail controller. These blue line snail controllers are very easy to set up and use. You have terminals for power coming in and power to the track. And power coming in will just be this nine volt battery that I have a uh, adapter on. And those will get connected to here. And then the track power wires get connected to here. And so I can just attach those wires with the screw terminals, no soldering required. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and get everything uh, assembled here, get the wires connected, get the controller attached to this roof plate. But I'll go ahead and get this roof texture stuck on here before I get everything else done since I wanna do that anyway. So again, I'm just using some double-sided tape.
And I'll just go ahead and stick this onto the roof paper, then I can cut it out. Just get the power leads installed here as well. Of course, even though these are screw terminals, there's no reason why you can't put a drop of solder in there if you do want to make this a permanent connection. Because LEDs have a polarity to them, I wanted to make sure that I have the LED inserted correctly before I attach this to the roof section. So that is correct. I just took a Sharpie and darkened the holes there so you wouldn't see the white edge of the paper. Although it didn't do a great job of that, but and that looks pretty good. So I can put a washer on here as well as the nut to lock things down. Okay, with everything attached here to the roof and can put the speed control knob back on there. Uh, all I need to do is attach these wires and we're pretty much done. Doesn't matter which way the wires are connected since the only difference will just be which direction your train runs based on the direction control switch. One last tighten up here. And then it'll just be a matter of replacing this battery as you need to. You can use a lithium 9 volt battery, which will last a lot longer. Those last a very long time. And I'll probably get one to put in here. But uh, for now, just put that battery there in the opening. Stick the wires back in. Just kind of stick the roof section back on and we're ready to go. Okay, I'll just put the tram on the tracks here. Then I can turn the power on. And we have control. So, you know, very fine speed control. The only thing with these snail controllers is that if you change the direction, it'll just come to a stop. You'll get a flashing light and you have to turn the, the speed down to zero and then go back up to change directions. But other than that, works very nicely. And this will be a nice convenient way to operate this little top portion of the layout. Okay, so to complete the top level of this layout, I needed to work on lots of details and to get the structures installed. The details I wanted to add were poles to support the overhead line of the tram line, although I didn't actually plan to add the overhead wire. I needed to add road striping, road signs, street lights, vehicles, people, additional trees, vegetation, and some other minor details. I also needed to paint the perimeter of the layout. So I started off with some Kato catenary poles, and these are all for their unitram line, and so these poles are designed for a double track tram line. I used my nippers to remove all the poles from the sprues and then nipped off the support arm on one side of each pole since I only had a single track. I did save those extra arms though since I plan to use at least a few of them later on. I sanded all the cut edges, stuck them in a piece of scrap foam, and then painted them outside with some gray spray paint and set those aside to dry. While that paint was drying, I worked on the road signs. I have a pack of these Titchy, if that's how you say it, signs as well as some Blair Line signs. And I started with the Titchy ones and just nipped off the top part of each sign from the sprue, but left the bottom of the pole attached. And this way I could paint them easier uh, since I could basically have all of them still held in place by the sprue. I put those aside for a minute and decided what other signs I wanted to use from the Blair Line pack. I cut out some speed limit signs and railroad crossing signs and then I opened up one of their packages of just poles and took out enough poles for each of the signs. I glued on the poles to the back of the signs and then sprayed them with some accelerator so the glue would set instantly. I put all the signs on a paper towel and mixed up some silver and gunmetal paint to use to paint the signs. I painted all the poles as well as the backs and sides of the signs with that paint mixture but you could also just use something like a silver sharpie marker instead. I set all those aside to dry and then moved on to the most dangerous and most risky part of this whole operation, adding the road stripes using 
a Woodland Scenics Rose Striping Pen. They can work fantastic or you can have total disaster. But if you're very careful and you follow the directions and you don't depress the tip for a long period of time, usually you're fine and everything will work great. So I started with a straight section of road at the top and used a ruler to make two parallel yellow stripes in the middle of the road and that's easy enough to do. Then I moved on to using a flexible ruler which is also from Woodland Scenics and then bent that so I could draw a curved white stripe at the start of a street parking area on one side of the road and then use a straight ruler and a vehicle to mark out additional parking spots. Next, I bent that curvable ruler to match the curve of the road and then did a center line for the first third or so of that curved section. That worked pretty well and then I moved on to the remainder of the curved part of the road and it didn't quite work out the way I wanted and the road striping kind of was not centered the whole way around. I left that for a minute and then moved on to painting that last straight section of road at the bottom and then I just simply painted over the road in the area where I messed up the striping and you know it's not that hard to repaint the road and you can kind of just redo the stripes as often as you need until they look good and so that's what I did here. And while that paint was drying, I worked on adding handrails to one of the stairways. And the stairway and the handrails all come from a Walther's warehouse kit. They were just left over from that. And so the handrails did match the stairway perfectly, so there was no issues there. I used one handrail along the road as a guardrail, and then I used the other on the stairs themselves as the actual handrail. And I painted these actually with a silver Sharpie marker since that was pretty easy to do. Then I just poked holes in the scenery for the poles of the railings and then glued them in place with some super glue and I think it turned out really nice. I eventually did get the remainder of those road stripes repainted and then moved on to installing street lights. And these lights were ones I picked up off eBay many years ago and they have LEDs in them but I didn't plan to have any working lights on this layout and so I just nipped off the wires. I did, again, use that silver Sharpie marker to paint all the plastic parts of the street light so it would match the silver metal poles, but otherwise I just drilled holes where I wanted each light to go and then glued them in place with a drop of super glue. And with those poles in place, it was time to move on to installing the road signs. Again, I had speed limit signs, signs indicating a curved roadway, and the railroad crossing signs. Really, I wanted tramway crossing signs, but I didn't have those, so I just used railroad crossing signs. I simply drilled small holes and glued each sign in place like everything else. And adding details like road signs really does go a long way to improving the realism and it's a lot of fun to do too. Once those signs were done, I worked on adding the catenary poles. Now, the Kato pole set comes with different length arms since the poles are designed to work with their Unitram set which has both straight and curved track sections. And you of course need the poles farther away in the curved track section so you don't have any clearance problems. So I tested out different poles in different spots to see which would work best with the numbers that I had so it would have proper clearance and I could get the center of the support arm that would carry the wire directly over the middle of the track. So once I figured out the best placement of the poles, I again just simply drilled a hole, put in a drop of glue, and installed each of the poles. Now in two spots, since there was that concrete wall right next to the track, I simply glued two of the support arms directly to the concrete wall since I figured crews might utilize that existing support structure since it was there and available. And you can see here how everything looked with all the poles installed. Next, I worked on painting the sides of the layout section. I just mixed up some flat and some gloss black paint to give a semi-gloss paint and applied that all around the back and the front edges of the layout. And that really does help to finish off the look of the layout section, making it look a lot more complete. The last big step was getting all the structures installed. Now previously I showed how I added window blinds and such to all these structures, but I still needed to add interiors to the lower storefronts of all the structures. In the past I've just printed out store interior pictures and used those, but I came across this Etsy store that has photo packs of store interiors, and so I decided to buy one of those packs and use those. I cut out all the interiors that I wanted to use that were appropriate for my structures. Then I simply put some glue on the edge of each photo and stuck them in place. Most will fit with a bend like you see here, but you could also just glue them on flat up against the windows. I also cut out and stuck a block of foam into the interior of each structure to help glue the structure in place. I scored the foam so the glue would have something to bite into as well, but otherwise did not attach it to the interior of the structure. 
I ran a thin bead of super glue around the edge of each structure and then put a big glob of hot glue in the middle of each of the structure on the foam and then stuck each building in place. The hot glue would spread out, bite into the foam and kind of spread to the edges of the building. So it was important to hold the building firmly in place. Otherwise the glue would start running out underneath the sides of the structures. So once that hot glue set up, I moved on to all the remaining structures and got all of them securely attached. Next, I glued on a couple dumpsters behind some of the top level structures and then glued on several vehicles. I tested the tram one more time to make sure everything still ran well and then moved on to finishing up the scenery. I used some Woodland Scenics fine leaf foliage for a few of the trees that I tucked in behind or between some of the structures. I didn't want to add too much to this level since anything near the edges would just end up getting broken off at some point. I also added some glue and some ground foam along the structure on the edge of the layout to help hide the seams and gaps along that base of the structure and the back edge. And the last step was to add some people. I added a bench along the sidewalk on the lower level with four people sitting there and then random people standing around the rest of the layout. And all these figures are from Woodland Scenics figure packs. Anyway, with that, the top level of the layout is done. And yes, I might still come back and add a few more details that are missing, maybe a few more weeds or bits of trash or things like that. But overall, I think this part of the layout looks largely complete and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Well everyone, the two by four foot end scale project layout is finally done. And today we're gonna to look at all the new changes to the layout and then run some trains. So anyway, let's take a look at all the new features since the last update. So the first change is here on the bottom. I moved the legs in from the edges by about three inches on both sides. I like the balance of the layout a little bit better with those legs not quite in the corners. So sticking with the legs, one other thing I've done is added leveling feet to all four corners and that will allow you to get the layout nice and level so your train cars don't start rolling on their own. I've also added another coat of stain and a couple coats of polyurethane to all the layout edges. Another feature was to add a locking knob to the top level of the layout. This top level is removable, but at the same time, that means if you open up this middle level, the top level could just fall off. So I've added a little locking knob here so you can either engage it like it is now or back it out if you want to remove the upper level. Another thing you'll notice is I've added these plastic acrylic protector screens along the top corner here. So if you're walking by, you won't accidentally take out some street lights or structures with your hand or elbow. But these are all just attached magnetically. So you can very easily remove them or snap them back in place. You can push in on them and they won't pop off, but you can pull out very easily. So if you don't want to include them because you have the layout in a corner of a room, you can just take them off. But if it's not, you can just snap them in place and have some protection for those structures and details in that corner of the layout. Another feature of the front of the layout is that I replaced all the screws with matching stainless steel screws. Uh, just a very subtle thing but everything is matching now in terms of the color. So I think it's just one of those little minor details that makes it look a little bit better. Sticking with the front of the layout, I've also added knobs to each corner of the layout so you can now much more easily open up this middle section. And I've also added a couple storage bins to the interior bay of the layout so you can put rolling stock or other items in there so they're not gonna move around if you do have to shift the layout or move it across the floor, that kind of thing. And of course, there's also room for entire boxes of rail cars like my Kato Silver Streak Zephyr set. Now, in terms of layout details, all these structures on the middle level are permanently installed, and I've done a lot of additional detail work around these structures. First off, I've added fencing to multiple structures here just to kind of add some additional detail and separation between the structure parking lots and the surrounding areas of track. All the structures now have some various dumpsters installed. And the structure here also has a couple shipping containers that could be used for extra storage, uh, a random junk pile you see here, and vines and things like that along the fencing. All the structures now do have signs, so you have names to all these industries. I've added additional trees and shrubbery around the structures and to other areas of this middle level in general. It's a little harder to see, but I have also weathered all of the track on this middle level. Another random project was to cut off the roof of this corner structure here on the layout 
and replace a bunch of the windows. I had knocked out a whole bunch of these windows. These glue in from the interior and a finger or thumb can easily pop out those windows. And as a result, fall into the interior. It's a tall structure. You can't get them back out. So I had to cut the roof out, re-glue in the windows. And then what I did was fill the entire interior of the structure with black spray foam, which not only served as a very effective view block, but also as that foam expands, it presses up against the window so they will never get pushed out again. I also added some additional street lights to this middle level. Again, none of these work. I don't have any of these structures lighted or any of the street lights working. I didn't really want to deal with that additional wiring on this project. And so they're just there for decoration effectively. But nonetheless, I think it does help to have those street lights there just for the overall look. So anyway, with that, let's run some trains. But anyway, this is a really action-packed layout for just two by four feet, running four trains at one time, lots of switching operations on that middle level, and just a lot going on in a small space, which I think is really cool. So anyway, I really hope you enjoyed the build of this layout. Uh, again, a long video. I really can't believe you're still here if you're watching this. Uh, definitely uh, quite a haul from start to finish on this project. Pretty complex with the hinges and multiple levels and you know different things that are going on here, the DC and DCC controls for all the different loops of track. So uh, definitely a complex build, but a lot in a small space. So if you don't have a lot of room for a layout, this might be an idea to kind of consider of having multiple levels to allow you to run more trains in the same space. And you can even just separate this out, have this lower level be you know, a foot below this middle level. So it's two completely separate, uh, you know, shelves or whatever uh, with trains running on them. So you don't have to worry about hinges and, you know, that kind of stuff where they're, you know, you have more vertical separation, but that's obviously not as portable. And that's the idea here that this can be carried around easily, put in the back of the car, taken to a train show or whatever and uh, easier to move around. So it's much more compact. But anyway, you might consider going vertical with your layout if you're trying to get more in the same place. I really appreciate you watching this video. Uh, if you have any questions on anything, just leave a comment down below. You can also go to the website. It's steves-trains.com. There's a link in the description to that. You can find more information there, see the track plan, download the track list, uh, get the AnyRail file if you want that. You can also reach me via email there with the contact form. So if you have any questions, let me know. But anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.